Order, order. Thank you very much for coming to give evidence this morning. I don't know whether to call you Boris or Mr Johnson. Uh, I generally call the Chancellor Chancellor. I suppose I could call you Mayor. Um, we used to have almost adjacent offices, and I suppose I should declare the fact that we know each other extremely <coughs> well. We do. And um, used to be in and out of each other's offices quite a lot years ago. Um, you represent London. What are London's views on Brexit? I, I can't give you any particular polling detail from Londoners, but I've, I've heard, I think, that Londoners tend to be uh, more supportive of remaining in the EU than other parts of the country. I don't consider that necessarily to be an impediment to my uh, position, which is to favour a no. change in Britain's relations with the European just, Union just uh, in favour of, of you're Brexit. But you're not take, keeping an eye on the opinion polls? No, no. Okay. I, I believe we and have a, a Burkean duty, you're Mr. Not a, you're not aware of the YouGov poll showing, uh, the recent YouGov poll, very recent, showing relatively strong support for remaining in the EU? As I say, I'm, I'm aware generally of, right. of that uh, phenomenon, but I, you know, I contrast it with the a national position, which is showing some quite interesting data in favour of, uh, of leaving, and I think that is the, the right balance of the argument, I must say. On, um, in your professional capacity, you are looking <coughs> also at the financial sector. Yes. And are you aware of what they say in... Uh, surveys and in survey data? Well, it is very interesting. It's certainly the case that if you look at the, the survey data, you will find people like the, uh, the CBI, the uh, Bankers Association, will generally tend to be quite strongly supportive of, of Remain. Uh, I think a couple of points need to be entered there. Uh, they have been supportive also of going into the euro, uh, regarded as essential, for instance, to completing the single market. Uh, it turned out to be a disastrous idea. In the, I think they were wrong then, that they're, they're wrong now. It's also quite interesting when you dig into uh, these people's opinions. Uh, they are much less strongly held uh, than you might suppose. And indeed, there are some very distinguished uh, bankers who are in, in favour of Brexit, uh, in favour of us getting out. And I think that they're right. I, I mentioned... Uh, Norman Blackwell of Lloyd's, uh, who made uh, a very good speech the other day in the, in the House of Lords, uh, Sheila Noakes of, of RBS, Henry Angest of Arbuthnot, uh, all have, uh, have come out and said that they're in favour of, of us leaving. And what, what has struck me in, in, in private conversations, as obviously I uh, occasionally have with uh, leading bankers about this, is you know, how finely balanced they see it to be, and, and most of them will candidly say that they don't believe it will do any damage to London's position as the world's leading financial centre. I and see. That, so is, that is the overwhelming picture I get. Is that how... Are you aware of the more, rather than the anecdotal evidence of your meetings, of the more uh, thorough work that's been done to try and assess the views of these people? The very well, people you're talking about, the leading bankers with whom you've been... Uh, uh, Con conversing, uh, yeah, conversing. I, as I say, I've given some examples. I think of uh, at least three leading bankers who no, no, no. Are willing I'm to stick their heads well, the I'm parapet. asking you whether you're aware of any of the surveys that have been done. Yeah, I mean, I'm, again, I'm, I'm aware of the, of the of the of the gist of the either. surveys, Andrew, uh, Mr. Tarry, uh, which again, as I say, do show uh, okay. a majority in favour of well, I've got many, but I would point out that they. I've got so the two important. leading surveys in front of me. One's by City UK and one's by the Centre for Financial Innovation. City UK uh, have taken uh, leading people in the, leading, in the legal profession, banking profession and accountancy, and they split about 84% in favour, 16 against. <coughs> I, of course, you may be right that their views are all lightly held and that that could all suddenly trigger think, like a herd I, I, of antelope in the other direction. I, I, well, I do, I do think that actually... And um, the Centre for Financial Innovation have yes. polled their 400 professionals on their uh, contact list and they're getting a slightly weaker 
support, but still very strong no, in favour. So the, what you're getting in your anecdotal meetings doesn't seem consistent. And the fact that you're not aware of even these... Well, I've said that I'm aware of the general thrust of the, of the surveys. Does strike me as surprising. Can yeah, I go I, to... I think I've said I'm aware of the general thrust of the surveys. And if I may say so, Mr. Chari, uh, the, the same balance of opinion was heard about whether it was right for Britain to join the euro. That turned out to be a completely uh, disastrous course of action. It was, they were wrong then, they're wrong now. You're hearing very much the same sort of thing from the same constituency of people. Mm-hmm. And I am, made, I, am, have, I am very struck You have by made that point, Boris, and we've got that firmly on the, right. on the record. Have you got a point that you haven't made, do you, the one that you're very struck by? Well, I, I'm, I'm struck by how, as I say, how shallow the, uh, yes, the, the, the enthusiasm well. for the European Union seems to be even amongst its supposed <laughs> advocates. Yes. Okay. In your Dartford speech, you quote some open Europe analysis. I don't know whether you know that you quoted some Open Europe analysis, but I did give you warning before this meeting that we were going to take a close look at what you had said recently about Europe, Yeah, uh, and that we go through this in some detail. You say, and I quote, British business, uh, uh, the EU regulation costs British business £600 million a week. Uh, have you taken a look at the methodology of that? Yes, figure? this this relates to an Open Europe report that looks at the most expensive 100 EU uh, regulations. Uh, the actual cost, of course, of EU regulation may be even higher than the Open Europe report. If you do 600 million a week, that comes to about 33 billion pounds uh, a year. Now, clearly, uh, when you when you talk about a cost like that, you, you I imagine what the point that you're you're driving at is what would be the saving if you were to get rid of all those regulations, and, and would you even contemplate getting rid of all those regulations, many of which might actually be beneficial, which are, all, after all, uh, incorporated into UK law, uh, and, and, and some of them may, may be very helpful. I think the point I would make is that there is always scope, if we get out, to amend and change those regulations in the interests of this country. And as long as we remain in, and as long as we have uh, the... Uh, 1972 European Communities Act in the way that it is currently formulated, there is absolutely no way that we can change any of that corpus of EU law. And the point about e-regulation, if I can just complete this point, is that it flows irresistibly onwards and forwards, 2,500 more every year, and every time the EU touches some area of law, and it can continually add to the areas of law that it, uh, that it affects and that it regards as part of its competence, that area of law and lawmaking become subject to the judicial authority of the European Court of well, Justice. Well, we'll be coming back to the 2,000. And that is the fundamental we'll problem. We'll be coming back to the 2,500 uh, pieces of the decision right. point later in the, in the hearing, I expect. Um, I just want to um, probe a little more this 600 uh, million pounds a week figure. You've described it as the costs uh, of regulation. Well, this is have an Open Europe report, a, as you say yourself. Mr. Have you taken a look at, the, at Open Europe's own description <coughs> of uh, the methodology that they're using? They're quite reasonable description of their methodology. Well, uh, as I understand it, um, it's quite sure what they've done is they've, they've looked at the government's own impact assessments in order to make their estimates, and they're quite conservative uh, estimates of the cost by, by Open Europe's account. I think one of the interesting things about Open Europe is that you know, they've been banging away for a long time in quite a, uh, a, a Eurosceptic way, but have, uh, are, are remaining, as far as I, I know, neutral in this whether debate. You've, whether you've read their own qualifications to this work. I've got a, di- I've got a digest of the, of the point that they make, which is that they've, they've done it according to the government's own impact assessments. Okay. Are you aware that what they've done is add up the costs in the cost-benefit analysis from the impact <coughs> assessment, but ignore the benefits? Yes, and I, I think I made that clear in my earlier answer. You, you are aware of that. And, uh, of course, if you add up the cost of a proposal without the 
uh, taking account of the benefits, you will always get a very high figure. If you were building a bridge uh, and you worked out the cost of building the bridge, you wouldn't have done you, many. You wouldn't uh, want to ignore the fact that the bridge might confer some benefits, would you? No, of course not. Okay. And, so uh, and a, I, I think that... Can I complete the point? Have you, have you had a look at the costs? O- open open Europe benefits. has something quite interesting uh, to say on, about, on, about the, um, the benefits. Since you, since you mentioned order, the benefits. Order, order, order. Mm-hmm. Have you had a look, Boris, yes. at the list, full list of costs and benefits of the measures that they actually are using? I did, I, did, I did look at the, I think it's a list of 100, I did look down the, the list. It's quite interesting that uh, Open Europe <laughs> themselves, you talk of the benefits, Mr Tari, uh, Open Europe themselves say that 95% of these benefits have not, in fact, materialised, which seems to me to be a consideration you might take into account. They haven't said that. What they've said is that the full benefits are very difficult to uh, quantify. Uh uh, which is not quite the same thing Uh and what they are doing is pointing, making the perfectly reasonable point that a regulation may confer a heavy cost on a small group but a much broader and much more difficult to quantify benefit on a larger group for example uh, a regulation that might reduce consumer detriment so would you accept so would you accept that in order to give the electorate a fair balance of the costs and benefits. At the very least, it's important to take a close look at the benefit side and also always, when quoting <coughs> a figure, to, to ensure that the public are aware that all you've done yes, here think, is add up the costs. I think the, and as Open Europe quite reasonably done, have said, and I quote, uh, it is important to note that these rules can bring benefits, including facilitating yes, yes. trade uh, across the single market. Yes, it is a pretty fair-minded uh, they also, and, and balanced qualification. They, they also say, well, they say, they say that it, they can bring benefits. However, they also say, Mr Tari, that these rules have not brought benefits in the way that was advertised or <coughs> expected. Now, I make, if I may make a general point about the, single, the so-called single market, uh, it was promised when the whole thing was launched in 1986. If you remember, there was something called the Cecchini Report. You'll be familiar with the whole drum roll of excitement about the birth of the single market. It was going to lead to a great period of European growth and, and dynamism. In fact, that did not take place. Uh, we didn't get the huge expansion in employment in the EU. We did not get uh, growth in the European uh, Union economies. In fact, one of the amazing things uh, about think, this whole I debate... Think the, these are all very reasonable points. Boris. Yes, what, I'm I'm trying, what I'm trying, though, is <coughs> to elicit from you is a much narrower. Yes. Uh, well, I think I've given you, given you the answer. Narrower question. The 600 million pound figure is very fair, considering that the o- Open Europe th- themselves say that 95 percent of the benefits have not. And so, you think we can ignore the fact that the uh, that the benefits are considerable in the list <laughs> of uh, measures? I think, given, since you yourself have uh, attached great significance to this Open Europe report, as, uh, as I do, I think you should also attach significance to the fact that they say 95% of the benefits are not materialised. The important well, point, however, we've the important point, that. however, that's can not I, can only I, can what I, they say, Boris. The important point. They, they make clear that there are benefits that may not be quantifiable. Well, the important point, not the I think, if I may say so, is uh, what you can do about these regulations. And uh, it is the view of Open Europe that they are costly, they are burdensome, and there are a great number of them. I think you would concede which fall too heavily on some sectors of our businesses. And the advantage of a Brexit would be that we could amend those regulations. Without Brexit, you can do nothing. And if you look at some of the stuff, the Working Time Directive, the Water Framework Directive, Data Protection Act, GM regulations, Solvency II Directive, many, many directives and regulations emanating from Brussels have, uh, either through gold plating in this country or simply because of uh, poor drafting or, or, or whatever, have been far too expensive. And that is the point that Open Europe are making. They're not ideally tailored to the needs of this economy. Are you aware of the exercise to try and find examples of gold plating undertaken by the government? I am. And, and I, did and you I, know that they struggled to find very many examples? <coughs> well, I think... There are some, but I, I, they I struggled. There, there, there are indeed some examples. I'll give you I mean, an example of 
Perhaps uh, of, rather of than plating. Me, for instance, for instance, I mean, I want, perhaps one, rather than give me an example, give you an example now, you might send us a list of the areas of gold plating. I'd be happy to give you an example now. Meeting, you know, only to speed things up. I'd I like to turn to your ooh, your I speech. Want to hear the truth. I'd like to turn to your speech on the twenty second February. Uh, sorry, oh, your sorry, your, your Telegraph article on the twenty second February, where you say um, that there are these ludicrous rules emanating from the EU and that this is a reason for your decision to leave. Uh, and one of the rules that you cite, one of the ludicrous rules, and I quote, is an EU rule that says you can't recycle a tea bag and that children under eight can't blow up balloons. Well, may I say, uh, Mr Tyler, um, if I... you c- tell me which EU regulation or directive says that children under eight can't blow up balloons? Uh, yes, the, the uh, European Commission's own website, I, I'll be happy to give you the, the number of the uh, press release uh, in a moment, uh, the European Commission's own website says that adult supervision is required in the case of the use of uninflated balloons by children under eight. And, um, you know, I have to say, in my household, I more or less mad, only children under eight are allowed to blow up balloons in, in my household, Mr Tari. Uh, you know, I, do, I, I do think that it is absolutely ludicrous to have this kind of prescription uh, set out at a European level. Right. At a European level. I think it is absolutely bonkers. And, and I think you, what, I think what, you what, do, what you do too. What actually says, Boris, and I've got the toy safety directive uh, requirements in front of I've me, just it says, warning... Children under eight can choke or suffocate. And it's asking that this warning be placed on the packaging. It's not requiring or forbidding a It's requiring it to be placed on the packaging. <coughs> it's requiring a warning to be placed on the packaging. It's not uh, prohibiting children from under eight from blowing up the Well, I think it, even the European <laughs> Union would be very hard put to uh, invigilate people's households in such a way as actually to prohibit people from blowing up balloons, the people under eight from blowing up balloons, Andrew. Uh, on, the, on, the, on your point about recycling tea bags, which you, which you uh, mentioned, uh, there is, of course, the, and this is a classic example, of gold plating. The EU Animal Byproducts Regulation of 2002 uh, stated that uh, stuff that had come into contact with, uh, with milk or with meat could not be recycled. Cardiff Council, Cardiff Council decided to interpret the Animal Byproducts Regulation 2002 in such a way as to forbid people from recycling tea bags. Now that is a classic example, in my view, of the confluence of EU legislation with uh, but that's overzealous, that's overzealous an, British okay, implementation, that's, that's an which, that which, 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 you, which we might call gold plating. That they can. Perfectly, we can perfectly well decide whether or not we want to implement it. It's not true, though, is it, to say that, it, that there is an EU regulation or directive that uh, yes, there prohibits is. people from recycling tea bags. There is it an would e- be true to say. Actually, it would be true to say that some countries might have gold plated, or some councils might have uh, gold plated, or some uh, regional authorities might have, or, or assemblies might have uh, re, uh, might have decided. Gold plate recycling uh, tea bag. I think you will readily appreciate, Mr. Tari, that without the Animal Byproducts Regulation of 2002, there would be no scope for the Council to institute that prohibition. And that is the. Uh, oh, they, is, are relying, they are relying on, the, uh, on EU regulation, uh, as I say, Animal Byproducts Regulation 2002, which I seem to remember, uh, I think that's the. There's a, there's a separate regulation that, that forbids you from uh, from burying your own sheep on on your own ground. I think the, the animal hygiene regulation. Well, we haven't got into sheep yet, but we are. Uh, there, we are, but there, we, there, are, there are there are myriad of these things, we are, and they are taken and used by UK officials, well, however well-meaning, oh. in such a way as to so this is add a, greatly to the burden. A, Okay, right. taken and used by or misused by EU uh, by, by British officials on the back of. Uh, something from the EU, which is not something which uh, prohibits people from recycling tea bags, is it? No, what it does—it's a misrepresentation to say no. that, you're, that people are prevented from recycling tea bags. Well, they are by Cardiff Council as a result that, of EU much, legislation. That's a much better description, which was unfortunately somehow omitted. 
from I think I, I think to be if you, if, I think a fair I think it was so really in that Telegraph article Cardiff. about the Stockholm yeah. syndrome of UK officials who uh, feel obliged to implement or, or take the opportunity to implement <coughs> overzealously em- legislation emanating from the EU. That is the whole point. And one of the interesting <laughs> things about this country is that we are far more enthusiastic about implementing these regulations than others. And we take it far more seriously. One, one of the nightmares I have in, in London is obviously trying to... Well, the problem is it's a nightmare. We have it's a series of uninterrupted joys, my job in London. But uh, one of the big challenges is getting more housing built fast. There's no doubt at all that EU regulation, legislation of one kind or another, environmental impact assessments, whatever, slow down the planning process. And you have to wonder whether those processes would be quite so cumbersome and quite so slow in other European countries. Because we do relish this bureaucracy, I'm afraid, in this country, and we do tend to implement it in a very zealous way. You'd rather change your line of fire from the speech and the article which are attacking EU regulation and the actions of UK officials which have caused the problem which, of, the, of course, which because the, the EU regulation did not itself bring. And you it yourself did. are saying... I you totally yourself, disagree with you. I'm afraid I must respectfully disagree with you, Mr Terry. Without the, without the e-animal byproducts regulation 2002, there would be no scope for the <coughs> officials in question to uh, enact this provision. Let's, other people can form their own view about well, the composting of tea bags. You, you, you said... I've got your book here, Lend Me Your Ears. <coughs> In that, you say there really is European legislation on the weight, dimensions, and composition of a coffin. Is that uh, yes? There is. Sorry, can, there is. Can you tell me where that is? Now that now that um, I, I'm I'm just trying to uh, that was a firm that was uh, that was to do with the shipment of corpses across frontiers. That's correct. And, and uh, I, I seem to remember that there were various British funeral operators, I think Kenyon in particular, a very successful uh, funeral operator in this country, that was keen uh, to have some sort of uh, European provision on this. And uh, the result was a Euro coffin, <laughs> as, far as, as far as I can remember, uh, or, or regulations on the maxima and minima of, so, so of who, Euro coffins. I don't believe. I don't believe that it was uh, remotely necessary for the safe and successful operation of the single market, or indeed, like, since, since like the whole term single market is widely misunderstood, free trade across Europe would have continued unimpeded without legislation on the size and shape of a Euro coffin. They probably, by the way, had to change those uh, those dimensions radically since everybody in this country started getting fatter and fatter. <laughs> Um, actually, it's not an EU regulation at all, is it? <coughs> well, it's a, a European... It's, it, as far as I, I... It's a long time since I studied this matter, Mr. Tony. You have to forgive me, this is more than 20 years ago. Uh, this is something that I seem to remember arose from some Brussels institution. Uh, so you wrote it in your book a decade ago, I don't, not 20 years ago, uh, and in fact, you, and your defending it now. In fact, it's a Council of Europe convention on the transfer of corpses, and it, in there, there is no reference to coffin weight dimensions. No, I think you're... Corpses. I'm sorry to say, I think you're... Nor is I, there any EU legislation, and nor is the UK a signatory. So the story is a... a I, 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 I must say... ...of your imagination. No, I don't, I, I'm afraid so. I, I think you're in, in error there, but I'm, obviously it is a long time since I... Since I looked at it, there was a, there was a there was, there was a, a question about the maxima and minima of coffin sizes, and uh, my memory is that it was to do with the EU. There was legislation, and that it was EU. Okay. Well, if you can provide that us, is that is that is my memory. If you can provide us with that after the meeting, we'd be interested to uh, take a look. I've been through quite a list there, either of things which require quite a bit of qualification to understand, and where I think a reasonable man would say. You had either exaggerated or misrepresented. The I don't think so at all. I think you failed utterly in your experiment. The, the, the extent to which the well, that's a judgment that others listening to this can make. Do you think, on reflection, and perhaps you don't, having just made that remark, it might be prudent, in the interests of generating a strong case, 
that you add qualifications no, in at the time that you make uh, these remarks. May I, may I just say uh, how strongly I feel about this? Because uh, I, there is a great deal of effort being made at the moment to uh, deprecate the views of those who think we should leave, uh, to undermine their point of view, and to, and to say that everything we say about the <coughs> EU is somehow mythical. And I'll give you an example. There is a... Uh, but what's that got to do with the, the question is, I've just asked? I'll tell you. Uh, you you've asked me whether I want to, uh, to recant some of the things I've said. Let me take I've the... You, I've asked you to make sure that you qualify yes. uh, and provide the full and balanced view in your own interest yes, and I think of points which may indeed, <coughs> in one way or another, to an extent support your case, but which, because of the language that you've used, and your one-sided description of them, many might feel, is an exaggeration to the point of a misrepresentation. Well, I, I don't agree with that. And uh, let, me, let me explain uh, why I feel so strongly about this. There was a, 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 an, an instance that I mentioned on the Andrew Marr show of the uh, cab dimensions that we wanted to have in London in order to minimise deaths of cyclists. And an organisation called InFacts, uh, produced a, well, wrote an article, produced an article on their website, which I think has been widely read, suggesting that uh, this was untrue, that there was no uh, such problem, and that uh, the EU had agreed unanimously a provision uh, that would protect cyclists with, with new types of cab. And I have to say that, having studied the directive closely, as I'm sure you have too, uh, Mr. Tari, uh, it is completely untrue. The, the directive in question, uh, I think 213.0195 from, from memory, uh, did indeed attempt to modify uh, the, the, the dimensions of, of CAVs, mainly from an aerodyna aerodynamic point of view. That was what they were trying to uh, achieve principally. There was, some, there was some change to visibility, <laughs> but it got nowhere near what we needed uh, in terms of lowering the, the driver and uh, getting the windows uh, big enough so as to be able to see vulnerable road users in the way that we wanted. And uh, there were uh, representations made to amend this, this directive, which is the Weights and Dimensions Directive, when it, when it was going through, and we tried to, to do that. Uh, but the truck industries in France and, indeed, Sweden... Uh, fought the thing off. Uh, we can't get it through. Type approval for truck dimensions, for cabs, for lorry cabs, has been passed from this country to the European Union. Actually, it only happened a few years ago. It happened in 2011, 2012. So I can't do it. The Department of Transport can't do it. We can't make essential changes to the dimensions of truck cabs in our country that would save the lives of cyclists. And I have to say, reading some of the, you know, the, the stuff from the, the Remain camp, you know, I do think they should get their facts straight. Uh, this is something that uh, I've tried very, very hard to make a difference on in London. Uh, we've campaigned very hard to uh, make cycling safer. We have an opportunity to have a new regime for truck cabs in our city. It would save lives, lives particularly of female cyclists. And it's a great shame that in the interests of propaganda, uh, what we have tried to do is being misrepresented uh, by the uh, Remain campaign. And the fact is that uh, we've lost the power to do it. It's been handed over to, uh, to Brussels, and I think it's a shame. What we're it should trying, come back. What, and we're, and it, what we're trying to do here is get beyond all the misrepresentation on both sides. Ah. You'll have seen what we've been trying to do. Uh, oh, with respect to claims made by oh, the well, Remain side, good. you sound surprised, Boris, no, but good. I would have thought that delighted. every question that's being asked of you is in that spirit. Um, you would acknowledge, though, wouldn't you, with respect to the very regulation that you're just referring to, uh, that the UK would have no say on truck safety standards in the rest of the EU if we <coughs> left, and that therefore your ability to influence what 
what uh, EU trucks looked like when they came to the UK, unless you banned them. Yes, of course, of course, would what? be very severely limited. No, would what you, you would consider do? that to be a restraint trade? No, it would be a very sensible measure, and uh, what we're already so you would ban we're, we're already you would, you would ban lorries that don't conform <laughs> or trucks that don't conform to your standards. If, Is if that I, right? If I may, we are. I mean, perhaps for the benefit of the committee, we are already pioneering the world's first safer lorry zone within an urban area, and we are already uh, instituting various requirements for uh, for mirrors, for uh, all sorts of ways in which, uh, for, for blind spots, uh, all sorts of ways in which we can minimise the risk to vulnerable road users. This is a further step that is technologically possible thanks to the evolution of cab design. Basically, what you do is you get a, a, bus, okay. a bus-like cab and you put it on a, a truck. They look fantastic. They are fantastic. They save lives. You can't do it at the moment because it's blocked in Brussels. Well, it's and blocked, it's blocked in Brussels. It's blocked by one country, in fact, isn't it? You well, it's either France or Sweden. I don't know. I mean, you, yes, it is France. Well, and, and the, I'm told that the Swedes, the Swedes the, also... The, the but, principle, though, that you seem to be arguing for is for some form of standardised regulation. No, what I'm arguing Have for... Have I not got that right? Uh, well, I respectfully, uh, Mr. Tarry, I don't think that you have got it right because what I'm arguing for is the ability of Londoners uh, and the you're asking uh, the for unilateral to, regulation to be well. That's that's the, in the nature of uh, of a of a safer lorry zone. I think it would be a right. good thing. And indeed, if you look even at the if, if, I, if, I make, if, if I may make a comparison, you are arguing for that even if it may be deleterious to trade. I don't believe it would be deleterious to trade. I think it would, in fact, what it would do uh, is it would stimulate the market for uh, better and more, uh, you know, uh, better and safer cabs. And I think it would be a great thing. And I think it would save lives. I think lives. at this point I'll hand you over to the tender hands of Jacob Rismond. Thank you. Very Thank much. you. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'm, of course, on your side. I'm a supporter of Vote Leave. And if I can just follow on from what the Chairman's been saying, you can assume that your design might even appeal ultimately to the French, because I assume they don't wish to go around murdering cyclists particularly. So it could be very innovative and successful across Europe if, they, if we had our scheme in place. But yes, others of course. I, I think the problem is, if I can be absolutely frank about it, the same problem has been that <coughs> Renault and Scania have been reluctant to move as fast as they might because basically they haven't got their truck cabs in the state of evolution that uh, they would want in order to be able to take advantage of this market. Other firms have. So the French have been using their position. This is, I think, it can only be passed at unanimity. As the French have been using their position to, to block it. And I think it's a great shame. And okay. if we took back control, we'd be able to make our streets safer. Thank you very much. If I can move on to the laws that are made in the UK that emanate from the EU. And you were making the important point about Cardiff and tea bags, because if they don't implement EU law correctly, <coughs> then of course we can be taken to the European Court and it can be imposed on us. So there is inevitably, because of the EU, not because of foolishness amongst councils, a need to <coughs> implement <coughs> accurately. <coughs> and if a tea bag's gone in milk, it must meet the um, animal products quality. <coughs> And, and that's the issue then of the percentage that various figures have come up as a percentage of UK law that comes from EU law. Uh, you've quoted on occasions the House of Commons figure, the 15 to 50% figure. We've also quoted a two thirds figure. Yes. Uh, the German Parliament came up with an even higher figure 85%. 85%. 85%. 85%. I, I wonder if you could give us some guide as to how you would like to calculate this figure and where, where you would well, get it from. I have uh, hot news, uh, uh, Mr. Rees Mogg, Mr. Tarry, the House of Commons Library has just produced a, another series of calculations. And they, you remember, the, it, you know, we, we've heard various authorities, uh, Nick Clegg, Chaka Umuna, uh, who said it was fi- about 50%. They claim that Mr. Umuna now denies he ever made. Uh, the House of Commons previously said it was 50%. They now say, uh, in, a, in a thing that's come out uh, either yesterday or, or, or today, that it's about 59% or 60%. And that, that's because you've got to roll together. You've got to think, you've got to think not just about the, uh, the directives, uh, but also about the, the regulations, so the secondary uh, instruments of one kind or another. And they are very numerous. And as you rightly say, as soon as EU law touches anything, it becomes 
Justice will by the ECJ. Thank you. Uh, uh, Michael Dugan, who is an EU public law expert, gave us evidence saying that trying to quantify this could never be anything more than an inaccurate guess. Um, within the bounds of inaccurate guessing, do, do you agree with him, or do you think that uh, he is arguing really his own point of view? Um, I'm sorry, I'm not familiar Ma with authority. No, but, Michael Dugan, he's an EU <coughs> public law expert. I'm sorry. Uh, you don't know who he is. I, I'm, you I don't must think I, I, don't think I, I wasn't familiar with his work before today. But um, look, you know, there, there, are, there are varying figures. What cannot be denied is that the volume has increased, is increasing, and ought to be eliminated. Um, that, that is it's along the lines of a very good 18th century debate exactly. in the House of Commons, indeed. Um, so you're, you're very happy with, with the figure. I think that's very good that we've got a, a, a new figure. Um, the, the, um, Dugan, again, um, worries that when we compare EU laws and our laws, we compare non-legislative measures uh, with legislative measures, and he feels that this is inaccurate, comparing apples with pears, uh, and that you would have to... Um, include all sorts of regulations that come out of local councils and so on and so forth. Uh, I wonder if you agree with that or whether you think that, once again, he, he's arguing his own book. Well, I don't know what point of view Mr Dugan has or what, what, his, uh, what his perspective is. My, my impression, certainly, is, and just as, as, as Mayor of London, I'm amazed at the volume of the amount of stuff that I come across every day that seems to have an EU origin, whether it's uh, as I say, public procurement rules, which uh, we obey very punctiliously, unlike some other European countries, or uh, whether it's uh, rules about the interoperability of trans-European networks that affect the dimensions of cross-rail tunnels, or, or whatever it happens to be. Uh, there's an awful lot of this stuff, and it seems uninterruptible at the moment. R rules inevitably come with a court of some kind, and the court we've got is the European Court of Justice. And it is said that that is essential to the proper working of the single market, because otherwise people could do what they liked and ignore uh, the, the rule book. Um, do you think that it is possible to have a free trade area without the European Court of Justice? Yes, yes, I do. And I'm very grateful that you, you raised that point, because uh, I think people don't understand. 70% of our, of, our, of our trade is with... with um, outside the EU is with countries we don't, with whom we don't have any free trade agreements at all. But of the free trade areas that there are around the world, uh, NAFTA, ASEAN, <coughs> Mercosur, not a single one tries to imitate this anachronistic, old-fashioned uh, system devised by idealistic French bureaucrats after the war uh, of a single judicial si si approach. Nobody else does that. And it is very striking that unemployment in the EU is roughly double that of the other free trade zones that I mentioned, and growth is, is, is much, much lower. And I have to ask, invite the committee to speculate as to whether or not this is associated with the volume and the rigidity and the irremovability, the irreversibility of, of EU law. And uh, I think that it's a system that it's, it reminds me rather of and when you talk about the ECJ, it reminds me rather of, of, of how the computer in, in 2001 that has basically slipped its, its human moorings and become uh, autonomous. And if you look at some of the recent rulings of the ECJ, uh, I, I think they are, they are bizarre. Though occasionally they are in our interest. I mean, I'm th thinking particularly of the location policy in relation to um, clearing of euros. Uh, where it was ruled, as I remember it, that the ECB didn't have um, uh, the authority to make the regulation. It wasn't actually a single market issue. It was on the powers of the uh, ECB to make the, the regulation. But it did go in our favour. Um, yes, do you well, I, 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 I agree with that. Uh, I agree. On, on, on the other hand, um, you know, it's, never be, it's never been my view that uh, the, a single currency was necessary for the completion of the, of the single market. No, but in terms of the um, clearing possibilities for the City of London, um, the European Court allowed the City of London to carry on with the clearing, uh, whereas the ECB was trying to stop it. Um, was that a, we do occasionally win, and do you think that the wins that we get are sufficiently important to outweigh the losses that we suffer 
and the undermining of democracy that is implicit in having a supranational court. I mean, that, that is the fundamental question. And my answer to that is that the balance has now switched against. And I think that, you know, uh, 20 years ago, m many of us would have said that the balance was in favour of, of Romania. And let me, let me give you a couple of examples where, where we're thinking today particularly about uh, how to... Uh, combat terrorism and the, the threat that that poses to our societies and I, I've seen various people quoted as saying that remaining in the, in the EU is essential for our security. Uh, I think it's important to put a, a countervailing uh, point which is that there are some ways now in which the European Court of Justice is militating against our ability to uh, control our borders in the way that we want to and indeed to maintain proper surveillance. If you look at the uh, the case of Abu Hamza's niece, uh, who tried to smuggle a SIM card to him in, in prison. We couldn't deport her, not because of the Strasbourg Court of Human Rights, but because of the European Court in Luxembourg, which is now able to adjudicate on the entire corpus of the Charter of Fundamental Human Rights. And you've seen also, you, you was also seen the European Court of Justice in Luxembourg uh, saying that uh, governments, states, security services cannot retain uh, data, mobile phone data, that is very often essential for monitoring potential terrorists. Now, what has that got to do with completing the internal market? What has that got to do with, with free trade? The answer is absolutely nothing. It is, it is morphing into a political union uh, of a kind that I think is no longer on balance in our interests. And I think, Ms. Reef, mark your point about uh, the protections of, of the city, I think the city would continue to flourish uh, outside the EU, flourish mightily. And I remember that the threat to Euro clearing was, was mentioned at the time of the creation of the, of the Euro. And everybody said that that would be migrated away from us. Uh, and that did not happen. Uh, but simply because the concentration of talent, the critical mass, is here in London uh, for all sorts of reasons that have nothing to do with, with the EU. Um, it's very important the point you make on, on the Abu Hamza family case because not only were we promised that the Charter of Fundamental Rights uh, would not apply in the United Kingdom, there's a protocol attached to the <coughs> treaties uh, that it was pretended uh, achieved that and the court tried to keep it secret uh, to save themselves from the shame of having interfered so directly in UK criminal law rather than in matter of the single market. So I think you're, you're absolutely right on that um, and that it's worth, it is no longer a sacrifice worth uh, making uh, and that even outside the single market is it not true that the WTO has um, <coughs> arbitration systems which are almost invariably followed by member states of the WTO when there are breaches of free trade rules. Of course, and, and tariffs generally have been coming down across the world, you're seeing more and more free trade deals done which involve virtually zero uh, tariffs. And you look at the, uh, I think the US-Australia deal uh, recently, 99, tariffs removed in 99% of, of goods of all kinds. From just, but even, even then, before, they, before the deal was done, there were tariffs were only running at 4.3%. So there is a, a, a huge opportunity now for us to get out from under an incredibly prescriptive, over over-bureaucratic system that is trying to create a single polity out of many and uh, strike a new future. Well, thank you, Mr. Johnson, for your very compelling evidence. Um, thank you. you mentioned the figure of 59% as the figure of... Uh, yes, you've got it there. Could you describe what it is, in fact, that is being... Uh, what, yes. How that number is compared? Certainly, uh, Andrew. Uh, it is. It, it is. First of all, you say it's hot from the press. What is, in fact, the document you're reading? From? I'm sorry. Eighth. Of, it's the eighth of. It is the, the amount of legislation from Europe. It is an update by the House of Commons Library of the, of the figures <laughs> that they that they give. Um, and the date. Eighth of March. There you go. Sorry, it's, it's not quite as recent as I thought, but it's. Uh, it it's is, in fact, 2014. Figure, but not to worry. You probably didn't know I, that. But do keep I, going. I, I'm so sorry, Mr. Tarrant. I, I was right. informed, Don't worry. It's not I was informed by my enthusiastic uh, colleagues I, that this I'd was like, a 2014. Like, however, doesn't seem to me to be what I'd like that, to know, that long ago. What I'd like to know is what is this 59 percent 
composed of? This is composed of the uh, number of EU regulations and uh, EU-related statutory instruments, I believe. And so you, you've really done exactly, and you're illustrating exactly what I began the session with, which is that you've come out with a fear which you claim to be hot from the press, but which, in fact, you don't know what it consists of. In but fact, it consists of regulations, <coughs> directives, and decisions. Decisions may relate to an individual firm decision. There are thousands of those relating to individual firms, and it makes clear... Are you disputing the, very, the House the of Commons same, Library, Mr. The same Tyree? House of Commons... Are you, no. disputing, are you disputing the uh, veracity of for, the House of Commons fortunately, Library? Fortunately, I do the the asking at these, <coughs> at these meetings. It, the conclusion of the note on this reads, all measurements have their problems. It's possible to justify between 15 and 55% or thereabouts. 59%. Depending on, I'm reading the, the note on which this, what you've got in front of you was based, depending on what is included or excluded from the calculation. Well, look, whether it's, whether it's 59% or 55%, it is an awful lot. And Fifteen was the no, is, fifth, is the range offered by the House of Commons yes, Library. Fifth, as, as and what I'm trying to point I, out as I, to you, as I try to explain, what earlier, I'm what I'm repeatedly trying to point out to you is that while it might be possible to put together a case for fifty-five or fifty-nine percent, it's extremely important also if you want to try and uh, acquire credibility in this debate to say there's a vast range depending how you yes. measure this and, a, and that may be as low as the House of Commons Library has said as 15%. That's, that, is, that is if you look uh, solely at directives and decisions. If you add in statutory instruments the figure rapidly expands and uh, since statutory instruments have effect in this country and uh, since they form part of the corpus of European law, and since they are justiciable by the European Court of Justice, it seems to me entirely right that we should look at that figure. And it is a huge figure. I think most people listening to this uh, debate will conclude that there is, there is too much stuff, legislation emanating from the EU, which we can neither control nor repeal. And that is the critical point. Once it... Once it uh, Once it I is promulgated, had, it think, cannot be reversed. I think we've had the, the key exchange we need to have on the extent to which we should attach veracity to figures like 55 and 59, or for that matter, 15 percent. Helen Goodman. Thank you, Chairman. Good morning, Mr. Johnson. Good morning. Um, on the 7th of February, you said leaving would cause at least some business uncertainty while embroiling the government for several years in a fiddly process of negotiating new arrangements, so diverting energy from the real problems of this country. How long do you think this period of uncertainty would last? Well, I, I think the first point to make there is that uh, I do think it's important in this whole debate not to blame every, every problem in this country on the EU. And uh, I don't. I think that there are. That's not what I asked are, you. I asked I'm, I'm you how long the period of uncertainty would I don't last. Think it, I don't think that uh, it need last very long at all. In fact, I don't think there need be a period of uncertainty at all when you, when you consider that. Um, I think the, the, the best analogy I can, I can come up with with, a, with this whole uh, debate so you're is, suggesting the, is the. If, 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 I, if I may just finish, uh, is the Millennium Bug, the Y2K. Uh, Alarmism, and people said that planes would fall from the sky, and that uh, computers would crash, and the economy would tank by five percent. I think nothing of the kind took place. I think there is a great deal of scaremongering and alarmism. That piece, as I recall, uh, set out two uh, sets of arguments, uh, pro and con, and it concluded, uh, I remember, uh, by saying that we had absolutely nothing to fear from leaving the EU, and, yeah, uh, that, is, and that is and that is the truth. Mr Johnson, those were your words. We've taken evidence from a number of people, including John Cunliffe, who used to be our ambassador in Brussels, and he says that the negotiations would basically have three parts. Well, after we have triggered Article 50, we would have a negotiation which might last for two years on our arrangements for leaving. We would then have a negotiation about our future relationship with the EU and in addition to that we have 50 free trade negotiations to undertake. 
Now, you've also said that the people of Europe do not vote as one, think as one, or speak as one. So how long do you think it would take the other 27 member states to establish what their negotiating position is going to be? Uh, I I, I think, for instance, one of the most interesting things about this debate is the sheer sort of negativity about our potential to, to do these deals. Uh, it, it is a, you know, I think we've become infantilised by the uh, fact that the whole responsibility for this is now conferred upon the Commission, and you know they don't have, in my Sorry, view, sufficient Jones- EU, sufficient EU, uh, sufficient UK uh, representatives to, to do it properly. Uh, bear in mind, uh, Mrs. Goodman, we already have a, extensive trading relationships. We have, we're already. Uh, we've been in the thing for 44 years. Our, our relationship with the EU is already very uh, well developed. It doesn't seem to me that it would be uh, very hard to strike fun, uh, to do a free trade deal very rapidly indeed. I don't think it would be necessary to invoke Article 50 immediately. I don't see why that would uh, uh, be the case. Uh, the, the US-Australia deal that I just mentioned, uh, for instance, uh, took only two years. I think the, you know, the, I think George Osborne is right when he says what we want is a British deal and a British deal that uh, represents uh, an opportunity to get free trade with our <laughs> European partners based very largely on existing arrangements. Well, I, don't, I don't see why well, that should be beyond the wit of man. It's not, it certainly isn't beyond the wit of man. Nobody is suggesting that we wouldn't be able to negotiate a deal at any time. That would be patently well, that's absurd. Terrific. The question I'm asking you about now is the period of uncertainty. You've said what so you've said rather a number of different things about what you think Brexit should look like. My question to you is, do you think the other 27 member states have an agreed picture about what the <coughs> relationship no. they want would be with the UK? I, I do, and I think that the, what they would want... I, look, I think they're not... They're, they're not uh, we're not having this debate in isolation in this country. I think everybody can see across the EU what is uh, so happening. You, you're seriously and I think saying that, pe- that you And I think, think that people are... If people are already uh, thinking about this and preparing for how they, our friends and partners, would want to take things forward. And I think that it would be overwhelmingly in their interests to do free trade deals as rapidly as possible. And many of them, as you, as you know, Mr Goodman, have quite substantial uh, trade balances in their, in their favour with us. Uh, they would want to Uh, protect their businesses, their industries. I think the UK is uh, 16% of of exports from the rest of the EU. It's a huge chunk of of their market. It isn't actually, it's 10%. I I, I defer to your... So 6% of trade is quite a lot. My information is that it it is 16%, but I'm I'm happy to... to, 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 16% of the GDP. Forgive me, 16% of the... Uh, of the GDP. I'm happy to, to look at the, the figures for exports, but if you look, for instance, at the, just at the German uh, balance of trade with us, it's 27 billion net uh, pounds. Uh, that is a very substantial incentive for the largest uh, and most politically influential economy in Europe to strike a deal very fast. Uh, that was advantageous to their But do uh, you think that w- the interests of the German economy and what they would want from the deal are the same as what, for example, the Greeks would want from the deal? Uh, I, th- I think that uh, there would be uh, a variety of, of interests, but people would want it. Obviously, at the moment, we have free trade uh, across the, the EU, uh, and I think people would want to protect that as far as they possibly could. Of course. Of course people would want to protect that as far as they possibly could. But in striking a deal, do you think that the interests of the German economy and the interests of the Greek economy are the same and that they could say immediately that they would have the same negotiating position and there would be no period of uncertainty? Well, I think you'd have to take a a view about uh, whether or not you were going to uh, strike an agreement with the EU as a whole. If don't forget, don't forget that uh, the EU retains competence for international trade negotiations, and uh, even on, on a Brexit, it would it would do that. So, uh, I imagine that it would the the Commission would be negotiating on behalf of both the Greeks and the Germans at the same time. 
and uh, I believe that it would be possible to do a deal very rapidly indeed based on the existing patterns of, of trade. And that, uh, is what, that is what people would Mr. want to protect. Mr Johnson, that's not how the process works. The Council of Ministers give the Commission the negotiating mandate. So the Council of Ministers initially have to have a discussion to agree the negotiating mandate for the Commission yes. to actually do the practical negotiations. And I'm asking you about whether the EU member states on the Council might not take some time to agree the negotiating I, I don't mandate. Think so. I don't think so, because I think the overwhelming interest of uh, European economies and indeed uh, several of the most uh, powerful European economies is to get such a deal done as fast as possible. I think that to the EU has had okay. already because of the Euro crisis the problems that they've uh, had there. They don't, I, don't, I think they would want uh, above all to minimise uncertainty and delay and they want to get on with it as fast as Well, possible. the EU crisis is obviously caused by the fact that the structure and interests of the German and the Greek economy are quite different. So I think you're being far <coughs> too optimistic. Could I ask you a question? Well, Do you I, want... I, by can the way, I ask you is, another yes, question? Can I ask you another question about the UK's negotiating position? Do you <coughs> want to have access to the single market? Uh, the single market is a term that I, is, I think, increasingly uh, widely misunderstood. And what we mean by the single market, it seems to me, is the whole corpus of European law, as I say, adjudicated by the European Court of Justice. It now, and in that sense, it comprises everything uh, from uh, animal hygiene byproducts regulations to the weight of uh, size of of lorry cabs to the we rights of the rights of the rights of the rights of the rights of of prisoners in UK prisons, and uh, whether or not we should be able to de to deport them, because all these things all these things are now justiciable by Luxembourg, and my view is that we should get out from under that system That's and not have I a free you. trade a free trade arrangement that continued to give access to UK goods and services on the European continent. And that is okay. what it's all about. Well, now, that's if you look very at helpful, because on the 6th of March, you gave the impression that you wanted a deal <coughs> like the deal the Swiss have. On the 11th of March... I don't know, who, I don't know who, who took that impression... Uh, but uh, my my well, my that's view. What you, yeah, that's that's uh, that's what you said on the sixth of March, and on the eleventh of March, you said you wanted to deal like the Canadians. Well, I, I you know, those deals I, are rather I think, different. I think so. If we have... I want, as I said earlier, Mrs. Gilman, what I want is a, a deal for Britain, and I think that uh, that's the that's what we'll get. If if we are to end the period of uncertainty. It isn't terribly helpful for those people who are for Brexit not to give a clear view. I've given you a very clear view. You haven't given us a I've clear you a very view clear at view. all. I've given no, you a very clear view. No, you uh, I, I have, and I, all, I know that we have 1,700 officials in this country who are capable of negotiating trade deals. There's absolutely no reason why it shouldn't be done very expeditiously. Indeed, uh, the, the, one of the interesting features of the Canadian deal uh, and indeed the, the US-Australia deal that I just mentioned is they were able to remove huge numbers of tariff barriers. Uh, we could do that. Uh, we could go ahead and, and, and indeed we'd be able to strike other free trade deals around the world, which we are currently prevented from doing. Mr uh, and, Johnson. Yes. The Canadian deal does not include financial services. I, I didn't Would want to. Want, I don't do want, want to imitate the Canadian deal. I want a British deal. So you don't actually want to negotiate like the Canadians. You don't actually want to negotiate like the Swiss. Uh, no, I want us to do a British deal. And there are and aspects. What does that mean? There are aspects of the uh, of the Canadian deal, the tariff-free <laughs> approach without uh, free movement, that I think are. Are right. I think there are aspects of the, the Swiss deal that uh, are less attractive. They've, they've just voted against the, the provisions for free movement, as you, as you know, and I think that, that would be, uh, free movement would be wrong for us. Uh, but I see absolutely no reason at all, given the huge balances that, of trade that they have uh, with us, fa favourable uh, to them, why they would not want rapidly to do a free trade deal with what is... Uh, whether it's 10% or 16%, one of the biggest export markets 
uh, that the remaining remainder of the EU has. Mr Johnson, on the day that you came out for Brexit, the pound fell, supposedly because you are a very effective communicator, and that made it more likely that Brexit would happen. When the Governor of the Bank of England came and gave evidence to us on Europe, he described Brexit as the biggest domestic risk to financial stability. He said there would be volatility in the foreign exchange markets and downward pressure on foreign direct investment, (coughs) on investment particularly in tradable goods and on household consumption. Are you not concerned that a period of uncertainty in the British economy would have those effects? Well, I, you know, we've, we've heard this... First of all, um, I don't believe that... I, I've looked at FDI into London at the moment, what's going on, confidence in the city, what's happening with uh, our economy. No sign whatever of people being discouraged from investing, coming to London. That remains... Uh, Massively strong, so I, I, I'm not quite certain what this period of uncertainty is that you uh, you speak of. I, I, I seem to remember that you know when we were considering whether or not to go into the euro, and thankfully made the right decision not to do so. Uh, people were saying very much the same sort of thing, and uh, it didn't transpire. Uh, on the contrary, London flourished, uh, pros- prospered as never before. Okay. And I, I, have to, I, have to say, I have to say, I think that the pound, if you ask me about the pound, the pound will, will, will be as strong and as robust as the, as the UK economy. And my view is that the, the risks are in remaining in the EU. The, if you look, why should we remain tethered to this sorry, anti-democratic we're not, system? Sorry, we're, I'm not talking, I'm not now asking you questions about the long term. I'm asking you questions about the short term. The period before yes. we've agreed our relationship, and the, and the period before we've agreed our new relationship yeah. with the EU, the period before we've negotiated 50 new free trade agreements, when the Governor of the Bank of England yes. is telling us that there would be volatility in the foreign exchange markets, this would have a detrimental impact on foreign direct investment, yes, I think on investment in the British economy, particularly in the tradable goods sector and on household consumption. I think it's now, important. if you could just look beyond the City of London, in the North East, we have 140,000 manufacturing jobs dependent on exports to the EU. And Nissan and Hitachi, the two biggest foreign direct investors, have <coughs> both said they would not invest more in the event of Brexit. Do you think, therefore, it is responsible to yes. dismiss as airy fairy these concerns about uncertainty and the impact on investment? Actually, you're, you're wrong about Nissan, certainly, because they've 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 changed their I'm not tune since the Euro, the Euro uh, controls. And as far as I can remember, Nissan have said that they would continue to invest irrespective. No, of the, Nissan uh, have not said that. What <laughs> Nissan have said is that they would not close the current factory, they would not move it, but they would not put any new investment in. And we get £27 billion of foreign direct investment into this country every year, and a period of uncertainty while you were deciding what kind, what a British deal meant would undoubtedly mean that we lost investment for a period of perhaps two years. Don't you think that that is a worry for those people who have jobs in the North East, in manufacturing? I I, I, I think it shouldn't be a worry, and I hope very much that uh, people will do their best to persuade those who are anxious that there's no reason for them to worry. I think uh, Nissan, as far as I can remember, Nissan uh, did take a strong line in favour of the UK joining the Euro and said that they would close the Sunderland plant if we didn't join uh, the Euro. Uh, That did not obviously happened. Neither of those two things happened, and that was the right uh, decision. I think the UK will be more competitive if we uh, leave the EU. I think we'll be able to set our own uh, course, do our own trade deals, and legislate it in a way that is in the interests of British manufacturing. Well, and a minute ago you were complaining that Renault wanted to structure the rules on truck <laughs> design 
Now, Nissan, obviously, are completely happy with the European rules on car design. Surely you can see that the, it, it, it's chicken and it, it's uh, it, what source of the goose is source of the gander. And we have 140,000 jobs yes, dependent but I don't you, I don't on see, this. No, because, of course, it, if this, when selling into the uh, European markets where there will continue to be a standard set at a European level, uh, obviously it will be in the interests of Nissan to uh, make vehicles that are acceptable for those markets, just as they make them acceptable for the United States, where they also have a, uh, many, many detailed provisions for, for what, uh, what they want in their, in their markets. And I, I really I, I think that there's a, such a, a deal of, of negativity about our ability to do this. And uh, we, are, we are missing, we, we would be missing a massive opportunity to make this country more competitive, to be able to set our own economic course, and uh, to restore democracy in this country. Well, well we've, you've made those points quite thoroughly. And quite early on in those exchanges, you were, um, I felt, trying to distance yourself from the view that we would want a deal akin to that of... Switzerland. You see, just over three years ago, you said we uh, could construct, I'm quoting, a relationship with the EU more that more closely resembled that of Norway or Switzerland, I'm still quoting, um, except that we would be inside the Single Market Council. This makes it sound as if you're very supportive of the idea of the single market, which you cast some doubts about. I, I, I do. I'm about, Boris, order. Sorry. I'm about to ask you a question. What is, what is the Single Market Council? Well, the sing, well the, there used to be something called the Internal Market Council. That's now, as far as I can remember, being, uh, being scrapped in favour of the Competitiveness Council or something like that. I, I, I think what, that... What, what, that what, is, is, what is this Single Market I don't think it is possible to, to do that. The, I was speculating there about a possible relationship you could have. It, is not, it doesn't really make sense because, in the end, you're either part of the single judicial system or you're not. And the difficulty I think we would have, and this is why, this is coming back to the whole uh, two referendums idea that some, some people floated uh, a while back, could you, could you, could you uh, as it were, vote to get rid of a lot of the stuff that isn't necessary and then uh, re-accede into the, uh, into the single... I, look, you're in the end, you're, in the you're, end, you're, the, you're, you're I'm giving you, I'm giving you a very, are, very are you, clear, I'm giving for, you a very, very clear position. Are you for or against the two referendums approach. I think we have one referendum and we get on with it. And then and afterwards, that's the end of our relationship within the EU. We don't try and uh, engage in another referendum. I think the difficulty Just to be of, clear, I, yes, don't, I want yes. to be clear whether that's your view that's or That's my not. view. Okay, that's and, all, and, right, and, all I need to know. And so that means Just that, that it, you can't be part that of the so-called... your view for a while. And uh, some months ago, and it's very helpful now uh, that we've had that that clarification. I think I've been pretty clear about that. You have just now been very clear. I think I've been pretty clear about that before this august committee. Okay. <laughs> clarify one more point. Do you agree that a large proportion of the trading goods uh, that would come in, as you know, the EU has a surplus uh, with us, so that that trading goods would uh, be covered under WTO rules? Uh, yes, certainly. And therefore, Germany, for example, is more likely to be able to get access than we would to their market for our services, which are dependent on much more detailed single market negotiations. Well, uh, it, it's certainly the case that uh, the Germans have, in my view, a, a massive interest in um, making better use of UK services and... Uh, I think that when you know, people say that they will discriminate, for instance, against the, the City of London, I, that has never happened in the past. And I think it would be utterly foolish of uh, European economies to uh, not to make use of what is a massive resource for the whole of this area. The City of, of London, right. financial services, all the service industries uh, the, in which we excel uh, are, are vital for any big European company that wants to raise capital, uh, this is the place to come. It always okay. will be. And I think I just, Mark, I just Mark I think excessively negative. I, I, uh, 
Good morning. I'm very keen to carry on with the City of London financial services specifically, but can I just follow up on, on uh, Helen Goodman's line of questioning about, about the negotiation and the relationship we have in total trade with Europe? Um, just to get sort of some of these figures, we, the, the UK represents about 15% of total GDP of, of Europe. Uh, for our exports, exports in terms of total exports to Europe, that's 45% of our exports. But in terms of Europe's total exports to the UK, it's just, it, it, depending on how you count it, either between 7 and 10%, but it's, it's quite small. Yeah, it's really, it's, it's, it's well, 7% of GDP I, and 10% in, total, in terms I, of total. But, no, but nonetheless, it, it is... It is I, I'm, I'm not certain of that. I, well, anyway. the, 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 the point I'm trying to make is, and, and it, look, it may be more, and I don't want to necessarily get too stuck on the points, but the relative importance for us, 45% of our total exports with Europe, is a very significant proportion of our total trade. But for Europe, 10%, roughly, is, 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 is not vanishingly small, but far less significant to the yeah. area. Do you think that does, does, puts us as a very poor uh, negotiating disadvantage when we start trying to... Uh, no, I don't think so at all. I, as, I, as I said earlier on, um, Mr Connie, I think that actually it's massively <laughs> in the interests of the... Uh, of our friends, our partners, to uh, continue to trade uh, freely, indeed more freely uh, than ever. They, they, they have massive, you know, the Germans, as I say, 27 billion pounds net surplus with, with us. Uh, they are the most influential in the, in the European Council. Um, even the French have a, have a considerable uh, net balance of trade with us. Uh, I just, I, I think that it would be very curious, but bizarre, does. Totally, totally self-destructive of them to uh, not. And there, there'll be think, the great thing is that this conversation is not happening in a vacuum. Everybody is thinking about this. Uh, the time is now. Uh, people can prepare for what I think will be a very exciting moment. I think one I think of the great things. About I definitely agree with that. But can, can I just sort of pick up? I mean, you, you, you talk about Germany and France. I think it's absolutely right to talk about two specific countries. But you can talk about other countries where they have um, trade deficits with the UK. And they would presumably turn around and argue that they don't want to have but such a... I think we cleared that, 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 that point great. I think we cleared that point up uh, a moment or two ago. In the sense that, in the sense that, as you, as you know, the, the, um, the competence for negotiating trade deals resides exclusively with the European Commission. And if I may just elaborate that point for a second, one of the problems that we have as a country in, in trying to do free trade deals around the world, is that the EU Commission does not, in my view, well represent us in international trade. So, for instance, uh, the audiovisual sector, in which this city is doing brilliantly, probably producing more TV and film uh, than New York will produce more than, more than uh, Los Angeles, uh, because of French objections, we can never do a free trade deal that involves uh, the audiovisual sector. It's totally uh, hopeless. <laughs> For the UK economy, we need to have uh, the ability to strike our own deals. Let me talk about uh, the financial services in particular. I think you mentioned um, three senior bankers: Norman Blackwell of Lloyd's, Henry Angst of Arbuthnot, and Sheila Noakes. And I can't remember where she's. Uh, RBS, I believe. RBS. Okay. Can you? Um, I mean, those all, all three of those banks are UK domiciled and would be in in the UK anyway. Can you think of any international banker? So, for example, some, uh, well, in fact, specifically somebody who is a senior member of, a, of an international bank, like Goldman's, Nomura, um, you know, Deutsche Bank, uh, any number of, uh, of these international banks, which have sought to come to London that agrees with the fact that uh, the UK would be better off uh, outside Europe. I, I can certainly say that. I, mean, I wouldn't want to, to um, give away private conversations, uh, but I can certainly say that the, there have been plenty of people I've spoken to from those types of institution who have felt, uh, to get back to where we really began this conversation, that the balance of the argument is much more equivocal than is commonly supposed. And they believe, and they really do think, that they, London would flourish whatever happened. London has, is, has got the right time, the, the right language, got a bank. huge... Yes. I mean, that doesn't concur with what I'm finding when I'm talking to these international bankers privately. Well, I, I have to say I, I'm, I'm getting a different, uh, a different message. I think, I think that, well, you know, they're speaking if to you, you as think, a Eurosceptic and me as a Europhile. Well, it? perhaps, perhaps that's yeah. true. But you know, I respectfully, you know, direct you back to what uh, some of them were saying at the time of the of the Euro debate, and I think Goldman Sachs was. Look, I completely agree with that. that but Gold, I, but Goldman I, but Sachs I was very say. clear that there would be you know, it was a, a terrible mistake for Britain not to go in. Uh, you, we heard the same from. Uh, the CBI, from Lord Mandelson, from all sorts of people. 
and uh, indeed from notable colleagues of ours, uh, Mr. Garnier, and uh, friends of ours. Well, I'm not an enthusiast myself. But no, no, of course not. I didn't remember one minute when you mean you were. Um, though I had the, the, the Mr. Tari back in uh, 1991 uh, wrote an interesting pamphlet uh, <laughs> suggesting that the single market could not be complete without a single currency. Uh, uh, no, say <laughs> that either. But fortunately, uh, and you've also misrepresented it quite badly. So I'm, well, I'm if, so, you go, if you go a bit further so, on in the document, so you'll find I'm some so, very interesting yeah. passages explaining why the uh, project of the euro oh, yes. is being formed at a single and rather dangerous. At the moment I see, I see. in the cycle, which uh, I do. So. I, there was another. So, there was another very interesting very, document. Very, it's very kind of you to have never, done. never say it's never. Very, it's very. It's Did you ever? Has anybody found documents? It's very. It's never very, say, it's very never order, say never. Order, order. It's very. By Andrew Tarry. It's very <laughs> common sense on the euro. We can, we can order. It's very kind of you, Boris, to... Uh, I just thought I'd read it up. To, to read all, all my material. Never say never. But it Time for British say common so. sense on the euro. I mean, it's you, are, you are illustrating exactly what I began the session with again, which oh. is very partial and uh, busking, really, well, humoresque well, well, well. approach to uh, a very serious question for the UK. And what we really need is a much more balanced uh, Well, there is. I, no, I'm not going to deny that. We need a balanced In which exchange. people make an effort to qualify and represent the, the points that they make and represent each other's views uh, with some accuracy. And you're, yes, you're at think, it again, I'm afraid. I think, yeah, I, I'm glad you said that, because I think that some of my views have been, uh, as I say, t- traduced. And I, I'm, I'm grateful to you, Mr Tari, for the opportunity earlier in this hearing uh, to set straight some of the gross misrepresentations that have been made about, uh, for that's instance... Enough of, that's uh, enough of that, Boris. Driver's well, Gary's got a question for him. Well, then, then I just was going to carry on with the, um, the, the, the line of questioning about the City of London. I mean, we heard a little bit earlier from Andrew that, um, that, that the City of London Corporation uh, has got an official position. I mean, many, many, many institutions have got official positions with, with you know, the City of London survey, a City UK survey, with 84% of respondents want the UK to stay in. And I think it's perfectly reasonable to accept that these city institutions are looking at it from their own interest, but actually, why shouldn't they? The government of the Bank of England has also said that if, if the UK came out of Europe and failed to uh, negotiate a, a, a proper agreement on financial services with, um, uh, with Europe, that it would be detrimental to the city of London. Do you, do you disagree with these institutions that are, that are pretty unequivocal about this? Well, they're, they're, as, as, I, as I say, Mr. Garnier, they're, they're not unanimous on this point. And well, there 84% there, is uh, there, agreed there, there are unanimous, plenty, there are plenty pretty who, close. Uh, there are plenty who uh, take a, an opposing view. And my impression is that the balance of opinion is very moderate about this. And most people think that the, just, the stakes, sorry, the stakes are much, really difficult to believe, much lower than they were. And I think the interesting, the interesting feature of even I think if exports, even in the last ten years, exports of financial services to the EU uh, have gone down from about 39 percent of our financial services exports to about 32 uh, percent, possibly even lower. As a proportion of our of our exports, they are they are already going. Now the opportunities are around the world. This is the moment to go global. And Some of the what, what I what I fear is that by staying locked into the EU system, where we consecrate the right to set trading uh, arrangements to the Commission, uh, we're missing a huge, huge opportunity. And it would be, I think it would be, ma- I think a Brexit would be massively beneficial but look, to Europe I, as well. Can I ask you just one question? Because, because you talk about the rest of the world. So we go out to the rest of the world and we ask them why they want to trade in London and why they, you know, why does the Chinese government want to have offshore remnants be trading in London? Why does, why do US banks want to come to London? And every single one of them talks about you know, the, 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 the cluster effect, the, the, the That's right. support that goes with it, but they also talk about the fact that it gives you access to the 550 million people of the single market, <laughs> and that that is something which is incredibly important to them. And, and all of them, all of them are saying we would be off our trolley to come out of Europe Well, I, respond. I, I think, well, the access to 550 million people is going to remain, in my view, and... But uh, how can you be sure? Because uh, especially when you be said in 2012, just, but just France because they would be those London. those countries, those well, countries don't trade with countries. Uh, people <laughs> Banks, trade Banks. with each other. Uh, yeah. Businesses trade with each other. Businesses need a great city to. Businesses need to find places to raise capital. They need banks. They need support. They need uh, services of all kinds. Yeah. They're going to continue to find them 
in London. And I think that if you look at the story of this city since the decision not to go into the euro, it's a story of unbelievable growth and dynamism, which all the uh, euro gloomadon poppers completely failed to spot. And uh, they were wrong then, and they're wrong now. And I, 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 don't, I do understand. I, I, one thing I've been, I've been wrestling with is this problem you raise. Why is it that uh, there's a certain type of person, uh, very often in the big corporations or the, or the big banks, who, who take this, this line? And I think that there is a, an enormous European, an enormous industry of uh, lobbyists, of people involved in uh, negotiations of conferences, all this kind of thing, who are basically, one way or the other, turning left on the plane uh, as a result of our membership of the European Union. And that is the, the reality. Can and I, I think the, the, the people that I think would benefit massively from uh, this change would be, I think those companies would not be remotely disadvantaged, uh, but I think the people who would benefit massively are the 95% of UK businesses that do not actually export to the EU, mm. but have to comply with 100% of EU regulation. Well, I think that's 100%. a wider, I mean, that is a wider debate for other parts of this hearing. But I, but I just want to sort of finish off with, like, in one area, which is, which is um, nobody can deny that the European Union, as a single market, is the biggest single economy in the world and the biggest single trading bloc the planet has ever seen. And it's incredibly important. Financial services are also fan very, very important for this. And then the rest of the world wants to trade with Europe through Britain. Now, what is key to a great deal of this is the, um, is the regulation that comes on financial services uh, as a result of British lead, but also Europe, and, uh, and, and the fact that that, you know, notwithstanding American influence with things, um, uh, you know, Dodd-Frank tax and all that, with, with, with the fact that, you, um, that the, these financial services regulations tend to lead the world in terms of the direction of travel because they are very good regulations. Were we to come out of Europe, we would have no influence on those regulations. We would be subservient to a, a, an architecture of regulation which would be being driven forward by, by Europe, who, frankly, I don't think is as good at it as we are. Why would we want to give up our position to be able to influence the world's financial service regulation? Well, I, 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 with respect, and obviously I defer to your, to your, to your knowledge of this, of this sector, Mr, Mr Garnier, but with respect, I don't think that's entirely uh, accurate about what would happen, because... Uh, many of these standards and many of these regulations are now set not in the, uh, the single market, the internal market, or the competitive discussion, or whatever uh, we want to, to call it these days. They're not set actually in the, uh, at an uh, EU level, but they are uh, international uh, <laughs> regulations based on, uh, for instance, bodies, acronyms, I'm sure you, uh, I don't need to spell out to you, the FSB, uh, CPMI, IOSCO, uh, in which... And you think about the IMF or, or the, or the, but, or the but WTO. These, these, the, the, the paradox, I think, actually, yeah. is that Britain, by Brexit, would gain influence in some of these see, multinational... Let me, let me explain why. Because uh, if you look at the WTO or at uh, the IMF or the G7, uh, G20, bodies that try to set standards for... Uh, financial services uh, uh, of one kind, and I try to have a have a role in this. The EU, as an institution, is now trying to interpose itself and to speak for all twenty-eight in those in those debates. But these, these and, areas and, of and actually, by by Brexit, what you would find is that the UK would regain strength so and influence in those in those is a, conversations. Is a fantastically, fantastically complex area <laughs> with huge amounts of overlap and huge amounts of underlap. And it's the underlap that, of course, causes the problem where you, where you start seeing financial crisis going on. There have been an awful lot of, of institutions around the world. We've had America. We've had, obviously, our you know, Banking Reform Act 2014, which I've been involved in with the Chairman and, and the Financial Service Act 2012. These have been led by us. And Europe is still catching up, but Europe is looking to us. You cannot deny that the biggest economy <laughs> in the world, the biggest single economy, has a, would, would have a less influential part to play in these international uh, agreements than Britain would, with a relatively you know, with an important financial services centre, but, but not the same level of influence, because it's not the same size banking market, if you... If you, if you abstract Britain. Britain. If you abstract Britain, yeah. No, well, well, I, look, I, I, I think what you... From us. Yeah, I think what you would... I think, paradoxically, what, what you might get is a, an intensification of European influence in global conversations about these matters, because you would have 
uh, not just the EU speaking in its uh, own voice, but you'd have the UK with all its influence in financial affairs uh, around the table as well. And uh, as, I, uh, as I'm sure you can envisage, there would be uh, a lot of co- coordination We're between well. us and, uh, and our friends. One of, the, one of the difficulties is that uh, we as a country now are more and more often outvoted in the, in the European Council of, of Ministers. And it is, it is hard sometimes to maintain uh, that we are effectively uh, influencing proceedings in the, in the way that we would like. And uh, I think there are alternative ways of getting international influence, particularly on financial services. Nonetheless, though, and I, and I don't, wouldn't disagree with you that, that, that as you get more member states, your, your relative influence gets smaller. And I would completely agree with you. There are many things wrong with the European Union in terms of the architecture. But would you not agree that it's better? Well, you probably wouldn't, actually. But, it's like, but, uh, <laughs> but, 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 but I think that's my why feeling is, is, is it is better. I understand. That, that if we're going to be inside negotiating and trying to change that, that organisation, look, I mean, we're better off moving. Mark, I'm, we're Mark Mr. Garnier, look, I totally... Um, yes, that was the position I was in for a long time. And I'm sure that was the position many of us have uh, been in before. But I think it just, several things have really curdled my belief that that was possible. First of all, Lisbon and the annihilation of the opt out over human rights. Uh, you know, totally, you know, we thought that, we were told that this had no more significance than the Beano, remember? And it's now, it's now the, the Charter of Fundamental Rights is, is now in, in the ECJ and it's being used by, uh, by the Court of Justice. It was perfectly obvious. I think a lot of people were very encouraged by the Bloomberg speech of 2013, by David Cameron's Bloomberg speech of 2013, uh, the talk of wholesale reform, of fundamental uh, repatriation of powers, and, and, and so on. I don't think anybody in their right mind could pretend that that has, has happened. And when you look at... Because it is a balance, and I accept that this is a, a something which everybody... Ha- you know, there are two sides to this argument. Nobody's going to, to deny that, but... In the end, when you look at the massive concentration of power that is now taking place in the EU, and you, you couple it with the loss of control over th- borders and over immigration, which I think has been so damaging to public We're confidence, in, Schengen, so. public confidence in, in politics, uh, I think the argument only goes one way. Okay. And I'm, I'm interested, you haven't asked me as, as Mayor of London about uh, the impact well, on our city of immigration. You'll, you'll, but get, I'd be you'll, get more, you'll get more questions in a minute. Rachel Reeves. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Mr Johnson, on the 11th of March, you said what I think we should do is strike a new free trade deal on the lines of what Canada has achieved. When did Canada start negotiating its <coughs> trade deal and what is so good about it? Well, as I've, uh, Mr. Reeves, as I've said before uh, several times, I think that uh, what we want is a British deal. And I think that... Uh, but you say on be, the lines of what Canada we, has we achieved, so... We wouldn't be in the same position as Canada because we've been members <laughs> of the EU for 44 years and we'd be able to do a deal very rapidly. I'm not and the attractions, the, of, the attractions of the Canadian deal, uh, one of them, the attraction of the Canadian deal, is that uh, it involves wholesale removal or very large removal of, uh, of tariffs, but that is, that is not the... You know, there's, there's a lot more we can do. Uh, my question was when the negotiations started. They started in 2009, uh, and at the moment they're not yet in force. So the EU-Canada agreement took seven years to negotiate, and it is still not in force. Yes. Uh, so it takes quite a long time. I expect the Canadian trade negotiators are pretty good, uh, and it's taken them seven years to negotiate a deal, and it's still not in force. The former Canadian trade minister, who had some part in these negotiations, wrote a piece in the Times t- today, and he says, it is fatuous to think there's a real comparison between Canada's relationship with the EU and the UK's with the bloc. Indeed, were Canada to trade as much with the EU as we do with the US, we'd want a much deeper relationship with, um, than the uh, Canadian uh, Yeah, I deal. think that's right. Uh, I think that's right. Uh, you know, I, I, the point about the, the Canadian deal, obviously, is that uh, you've got two very different systems, two very different uh, trading uh, relationships. They've, they've decided the EU, EU, EU deal uh, with Canada 
uh, took a while to negotiate. I don't see why on earth that should be the case in the, uh, with, uh, with the UK, which has been a member of the EU for 44 years, as I said. And I, and I, I point you to the uh, US-Australia deal, which was completed in less than two years. Uh, well, the difference, Mr Johnson, with respect, between the US-Australia deal and a deal with the EU, and this is what um, Pierre Pettigrew in The Times says today, any ambitious deal has to be ratified in the case of the EU in 27 le legislatures. That's not the same with a deal between the US uh, and Australia. That is why <coughs> it takes uh, time. Uh, the, the Pettigrew goes on to say that means years of uncertainty, barriers to trade for UK firms, and a likely drop in inward investment. Well, you I said, in the, you I'm said, not seeing sorry, any, I'm not sorry, I haven't Pettigrew. finished, Mr. Johnson. <coughs> in your uh, response to uh, Mr. Garnier, you said that there are, of course, arguments on both sides. I think these are pretty compelling arguments. No, I don't think those are good Indian. arguments at all. Not? No, I think I, I don't, the argue, there are no there are no good economic arguments. There are good political arguments, but I don't think there are any good economic arguments. So the and governor of the Bank of England is not making good economic arguments well, I, for yeah. staying in the European Union. The Chancellor is not making good economic arguments for staying in the European Union. The CBI, they're all making political arguments and not economic ones. Is that what you are uh, suggesting, yes. Mr. Johnson? Yes, um, I am, and I think that. Um, you know, you know, quite quite seriously, the uh, economic impact of Brexit uh, would be positive. Uh, in fact, uh, my uh, economic advisor Gerard Lyons, I think, said it would be overwhelmingly uh, positive. It was the right thing uh, to do, and uh, I, I have to say I agree with him. I think that uh, it would it would unshackle us from a great deal of excessive uh, regulation, and it would be a huge boost for British democracy. And we take back control of, of very considerable sums of money. Do you think that part of the success of the UK economy is um, uh, being an outward-looking trading nation? Yes, I do, and I think it's in, a great... In that case, do you not think that having free trade with our nearest neighbours is an important part of our success I do, as an economy? I, I do, and I think I see absolutely no reason why that should not be... Perpetuated. Well, you may see absolutely no reason for it not being perpetuated, but it needs the agreement of 27 legislatures, which, as Canada has found and is still finding, is not always that easy to look, you know, achieve. Th what evidence do you have for suggesting, Mr Johnson, like, that know, we will be able to achieve an agreement in two years? I think uh, I'd, I'd cite uh, the Prime Minister, David Cameron, would be able to trade freely. Yes, of course we will. Uh, Lord Kerr, who, uh, who said... Uh, of course, we'd be able to do a free trade deal. Can you point uh, to any EU. trade agreements between they, the EU and another country that have no taken reason. less than two years, Mr. Johnson? I'm sorry, sorry. Can you again? point to any trade agreement between the EU and uh, a, well, another country that has taken less than two years to negotiate? Don't forget, no, don't forget, because I think people will, you know, will want to, the, to understand the context. The UK will remain within the UK's will remain within the existing treaties for two years anyway. Uh, and I believe there will be abundant time to negotiate a free trade deal. And if you can point to me any European country uh, that wishes to, uh, any EU country that wishes not to do a free trade deal with us, then, I, then I'd be interested to hear about well, it. Well, it's our prerogative to ask questions in this committee, Mr Johnson. I've asked you a question. Well, I'm telling you that, I'm telling whether, you that no, we have absolutely no... Mr notes Johnson, with respect... Sorry, Rachel. Thank you, Mr Chairman. With respect, Mr Johnson, my question was, do you know of any trade deal between the EU and another country that has taken less than two years? Yes or no? Given that we are members of... And one of the reasons... No, I don't. And one, no. That, is one of the, that is one of the defects okay, of the EU. Okay, I think that's OK, then I'll move that on to That is one of the defects of the EU. <laughs> Just, that, you're making my point, if I may say so, Mrs Rees, because uh, one of the catastrophic weaknesses of the system is that the EU is unable, is, is unable to strike these deals. They cannot do a free trade deal even with China. Iceland has done a free trade deal with China. Switzerland has done a free You're trade rather, deal Mr. with Johnson, China. You're rather, Mr Johnson, I believe, what? making my Why? point that no. it's very difficult to secure it these is. type of trade, ar trade <laughs> arrangements. You, you, I'm afraid. And given that it takes um, uh, such a long time to make uh, a, a deal and we are dependent uh, on and free trade I with think these this countries. is absolute scaremongering and total nonsense. Well, Total scam. The the, there Mr. already Johnson. is. There already is, as you know perfectly well, a free trade area 
uh, in the European landmass stretching from Portugal to Turkey to the borders of Russia. And it is absolutely nonsensical to uh, try to pretend that uh, post-Brexit, Britain is somehow going to be a British company. I get back to my point. It is not Britain that trades. It is British people, British companies, British funds. Uh, They will continue to trade and more than ever before uh, with countries, with people, with partners on the continent of Europe. And uh, I think it is, don't forget, 70% of our uh, non-EU trade is, is is done without any trade deals, whatever. We, we, may, deal well, whatever. we may well trade. And However, whether we uh, have a trade um, agreements and whether we have uh, tariffs and other non-tariff barriers... Why would, you, why would, is why my, would they put tariffs at point? Order, order Sorry. Boris, you really have got to stop interrupting people I'm so trying sorry. to ask Forgive questions. Me. And if I may say so, when you answer the questions, it would help if you do try and address the question that was asked, even if it may not I think I demolished all the questions we've asked so far. The, the, uh, the one that you would like to hear or have asked. I, mean, I know uh, right. you were giving <coughs> hints right. on what you'd right. like right. us to ask, but we make up our minds what we're going right. to ask here. Forgive me. Rachel Reeves. Thank you very much, um, Mr Chairman. If we um, look back at Canada, and I, I, I pick on Canada because it's the, the country that you cited uh, in, as an example, um, or, or you said that, that what you thought we should do was strike a deal on the lines of Canada. So I'd like to look a little bit more at the uh, uh, Canadian uh, deal. Do you think that the Canadian deal is good uh, for the service sector in Canada in accessing EU markets? With great respect, like this, uh, this question has been asked before. I think the Canadian deal is has some aspects that I think are attractive, such as the removal of uh, 97 or possibly 98% of, of tariffs, uh, that seems to me a, an attraction. It, uh, it is clearly not uh, ideal uh, for the UK. What we want, as George Osborne has rightly said, is a, a British deal, and that's what we'll get. Well, let's look at the tariffs, and then let's look at the non-tariff um, barriers. If you look at agriculture, for example, uh, uh, some tariffs, um, uh, tariffs have been eliminated in most areas, but not all. Um, more than 90% of UK beef and sheep exports go to the EU, uh, but tariffs on those, uh, those exports uh, uh, for, for Canada uh, still exist, um, um, tariffs of more than 12% if you go over a certain <coughs> quota. Uh, so there are still substantial tariff um, barriers in areas. So do you think that the Canadian uh, deal uh, would be good for farmers in the UK if we were to secure no, that the, deal? As I say, uh, the, the, there are attractions to the Canadian deal. Uh, there are obviously things that we would do much, much better. And I think that the fact that the e- UK has been part of the EU for 44 years augurs very well for doing a substantial free trade deal involving a comprehensive uh, deal both on services and goods and, and indeed on agricultural products. So they have... Uh, our friends have absolutely no interest not to do such a deal. Well, you make that assertion, um, Mr Johnson, but uh, the um, German finance minister, um, uh, Wolfgang uh, Schäuble, uh, who appeared on Andrew Marl um, on the same day that you did, uh, said you are either in the single market or you are not in the single market, and if you're not in it, then you have uh, trade arrangements. <coughs> uh, so we may have those arrangements, as you rightly say, currently, but there's no guarantee uh, whatsoever that we would have the same sort of access in the, the other countries you have mentioned uh, the, this morning, uh, Switzerland and Norway, uh, uh, have to both contribute to the EU budget and accept uh, uh, free movement. You seem to want to have the best of both worlds, which I'm sure we all would agree would be fantastic. However, that's the, the reality. The reality that's is it. not always uh, uh, the, um, the, the reality is not always uh, the same. And I like to deal in realities, okay. uh, Mr. Johnson. If we move on now uh, to the other aspects of the Canada deal. Um, Inside the EU, financial firms based in the UK can sell their services directly to EU countries through passporting. <coughs> Does Canada have those arrangements in its deal with the uh, EU? On, on passporting, I, I see absolutely no reason why they, uh, our friends, our partners, should not want to uh, continue current arrangements when you consider that uh, their banks benefit very considerably from 
their presence in, in London. Uh, they would want to have reciprocal arrangements. <laughs> I think Deutsche Bank has about 8,000 employees in London. Um, sorry, just to tell you and tell everybody in the room, at 11 a.m. the division bell will sound and we will observe one minute silence, uh, as will the rest of the House of Commons, uh, in respect for the uh, in respect for the events in Brussels. Rachel, do carry on, but you, you may need to interrupt your answer. Thank you. Yes, of course. Thank you. Um, um, Mr. Uh, Chairman, uh, ag again, Mr. Johnson, you assert that we will get these arrangements, but presumably Canada wanted uh, these arrangements and wanted, the, um, um, wanted further barriers to be broken down, but that was not to be uh, achieved. And I don't think that, that there is any evidence that we will uh, get everything that we want uh, through a um, negotiation. Uh, other areas a bit where. Defeatist, if I may say so. Anyway. Well, you're not pointing to any evidence. I'm pointing to the evidence that exists based on the trade deal that you cited as the type of trade deal that you um, uh, wanted. And when we're making such important decisions uh, uh, and when our constituents are having to make such important decisions, I think they need to do that based on the facts. Um, if you look again at the um, airline uh, industry, uh, the, the relationship with the... Um, with, with, between Canada and the EU, again, does not afford uh, the same sort of access that the single market does. So I believe there are risks for uh, farmers from the Canada uh, deal, there are risks to financial services, there are risks to airlines, and risks to uh, motor manufacturers as well. And I'm afraid, Mr Johnson, you haven't provided any evidence uh, that we could secure a well, deal Well, I, I, I merely point out to you that, unlike Canada, we've been a member of the European Union for 44 years. And we, because of our membership of the EU, we have access to the single market and, and, the, and, and, the, and, and the abolition and of tariffs and, and other trade barriers. You are, Mr Johnson, making my point. It's because we are members of the no. EU that we have a better deal no, than your, Canada. My point is that it's thanks to uh, the close relationships, close understanding that there is between uh, our countries and our systems of trade, I think there would be absolutely no difficulty at all, given the substantial balances that they have in their favour with us, and I'm speaking particularly about France, Germany, but also Spain and other countries, uh, there's no, I think there'd be absolutely no difficulty whatever in getting a free trade deal. This is a point, order. by the way, this is a point, by the way that is conceded order. by we are absolutely at, everyone. We are at 11am, uh, and you'll be invited to continue in just a moment. <coughs> Do continue, Boris. Uh, you were halfway through a report <coughs> to... Well, I think I, I completed my point, which you is said, that there's no, there's no reason... There's no reason. no difficulty at all in negotiating. I, 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 and I, I, I genuinely I think, think that, that there's, a, there's, a, there's a defeatism uh, that rises off this debate. We have a, a huge number of very competent uh, officials, uh, about 1,700 who are capable of negotiating trade deals. Uh, the pity of, of it is that in the European Commission, uh, which does our trade deals for us, only 3.6%, 3.6% of Commission officials come from this country. And I'd ask, like to know how you think, well, I'm not going to get an answer to this, I'll ask this rhetorically, I'd ask, how do people think we can expect uh, that European Commission to do deals with other countries around the world that reflect Britain's needs? Yeah. 
Well, Mr Johnson, you're the, the, the person who, in your speech on the 11th of March, cited the Canadian deal. It took seven years to negotiate. It's going to take seven years to, uh, to fully implement. Um, I don't want to take until 2030 to get access to markets that we can access uh, today. And let, just last of all, let me just um, quote from... It is a free trade, is a free sorry, trade sorry, area. Sorry, let me from, ask from my question. Um, John Cunliffe, who gave evidence to this committee on the 8th of March, who is one of those 1,700 people who could do art negotiations, uh, and he was indeed our ambassador to the UK representative um, in Brussels, and he was uh, um, for many years the Sherpa on G20 uh, deals. He said, different countries have very different views, and I would personally expect, regardless of what the UK decided it wanted, that on the European Union side it would take some time for them to work out what they wanted to do. He is one of those 1,700 people who you uh, say would be able to do these negotiations. I have every confidence he would be able to do the negotiations, but as he says, it will take some time, and I don't think that's time that British businesses well, you've got and employers can afford. Well, I don't I think you're, I'm afraid you're being too pessimistic, both about British business and about uh, our ability to do these deals. And indeed, uh, if you look at uh, what the Prime Minister has said, uh, what uh, Lord Kerr has said, what virtually everyone who was a you, permanent representative uh, to the EU, uh, there is absolutely no doubt that we could do a free trade deal and do it, in my view, in very short order, because uh, it is overwhelmingly in the interest, not just of of the UK, but of our partners, to do such a deal. And yet Wolfgang Schäuble not by the that, way. That, 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 that you, it was like you were either in the single market or you had uh, a trade agreement. Yes, and that's, what, and, and that's what we want. And we will have a trade agreement that will give us all the benefits, you believe, Mr Johnson, yes, but absolutely. none of the absolutely. costs. Absolutely, and that is, that, is, that, is the, that is the way forward. And, and I'd just, just remind and you, you that, that it's, no it, is, it is the monetary... Yes, because the, it is the... If you <laughs> yes, look at what's yes. happening <laughs> at the... Uh, I, I, I say that because if you look at the, uh, what Wolfgang Schäuble said... <laughs> Uh, I remember that interview. He spoke of uh, the disaster, the, a disaster that would happen uh, on the European continent if the, or a disaster for the European economy if the if the UK uh, left. And actually, uh, in my view, the disaster is being caused by the euro and the uh, catastrophic uh, failure of that uh, policy, part, and, and driven by. Uh, Germany. Uh, if you look, unemployment rates in, in Greece are still about yeah. are still about fifty percent. Well, I, I, what I'm saying is, I, I'm, not gonna, I'm not going to take lessons from Wolfgang Schäuble about economic disaster in Europe. Okay. You know, this look is, at what has look at what has happened. Yes. Look at what has happened on that continent. Look at the other. If you if you you know okay. you, you, order, you order, came to represent order, working Boris. people, look order, at what has happened to order, the people in Europe. Boris, when I ask you to uh, quiet them down, I'd be grateful if you did. Uh, that may or may not be a very interesting point, but it's certainly not very closely related to the question you were asked. I would like to ask you a question, though, that is closely related to what you asked. Is there, I should tell you I don't know, really, is there a free trade agreement, um, a bilateral uh, free trade agreement between two regional bodies or one country and a regional body that gives full access to financial services? I, I can't give you the answer to that. I don't know. No, I, I don't think there is. But if there is, perhaps but, you'll come back and let us know. But if you, if, if, if by yeah. that question you're, you're in, in, implying that these the, things are very difficult to the, negotiate, no, Boris. That's if you're, what I'm implying. If, you're, if you're implying that the rest of the European Union were to be so foolish as to discriminate against uh, UK financial services, I think that would be wholly wrong. I don't think that would happen. Uh, for one minute, and uh, the, 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 the precedent is amply there in the case of the euro. We were told we were yes. told that money and power and banks would migrate away from London. It did not happen. Yes. Uh, they, they were wrong then, and they are wrong now. And those who said that Include, needed a single currency all those to complete the single market, polled, the business uh, were wrong. leaders, the eighty-five percent in those polls, the seventy odd yes. percent in, in another poll. You, you made one other remark, which I think we just need they to are. clarify. You, you said that the Governor of the Bank of England was making a political argument. Do you think the Governor was going beyond his remit no, in doing I, I that? Th uh, no, I have a high regard for the, for the Governor of the Bank of England. I wouldn't want to, uh, for, uh, you know... So I do, think, do, I, you, I, do, you, do you think his remit 
can uh, cope with him making political arguments? Do you think that is part of his remit? Well, I think I, I know that you've had him to you before your committee recently, and I'm sure you asked him something on, the, on those on those lines. I, I think that he's uh, he's expressing his his views as governor of the Bank of of England. I, I happen to think that. But was he right to do so or wrong to do so? I'm asking you. Well, he, I think he has a perfect right to express his views. I don't happen to agree with them. That's clear enough. We're streeting. The government has a right to make an economic argument or a political argument. I think he's got a perfect right to express his views. An economic ar- so the governor should be able to make a political argument about the European referendum, should he? Well, I, th- I think what the governor of the Bank of England was saying was that uh, there were short-term downside well, we heard, risks. Well, to be fair, we, we heard what he had said. I don't need it translated. Um, but Andrew, I think it's wholly inconsistent for you to say that there isn't an economic argument for remaining in the European Union, but it's an economic argument the government's, governor's made and yet you have confidence in him. If the Governor of the Bank of England was making an economic argument that I didn't agree with, I'm not sure I'd share your confidence, but that's about as consistent as some of your other positions that we've heard this morning. Um, I want to pick up Rachel Reeves' point about, about the negotiation post-referendum. You seem to think, unlike our former man in Brussels, who's been at the heart of European negotiations for years, that we'll be able to negotiate a favourable deal pretty much on the same terms as we have now because we've had that relationship with the European Union. That's right. On what basis? What possible evidence? Surely, on the, on well, the basis that surely, it's... surely we'd face some penalties. Why? Because you, you made that argument yourself in August 2015 in Der Spiegel newspaper in Germany, and I'm just wondering if you make a, a Europhile argument to pro-Europeans, whether in this place or in Europe, and a Eurosceptic argument to Eurosceptics. But nonetheless, you said yourself in August 2015 we would face some penalties. What penalties did you have in mind? Well... You know, uh, I'm sure that there would be some you know, penalties. I, I, I frankly have no idea what uh, penalties they might be so foolish as to try to impose. But the, there would be, let's, let's face it, there would be some short-term feeling of hurt, perhaps, on um, part of some of our European friends and partners. And it'd be, very important to allay those and to point out that it was uh, overwhelmingly in the interests, not just of the, of the UK, but of the whole of the European Union, that we should stop a system that is, in my view, out of control, is uh, anti-democratic, <coughs> and is weakening the trust of people in, in politics. And uh, if you look at what's happening across the EU, you've got the rise of the far right, uh, you've got anti-German demonstrations taking place in, in Greece. Well, let's, let's keep things... And, it's, and, keep it's, things and I, think that the, I think that the EU has been, uh, certainly the monetary union experiment, has been very damaging. And, and, but unrelated <laughs> to our membership of the European Union, we're not in the euro. You've repeatedly this morning talked about the euro, or indeed risk of exposure <clears> to the euro, even if we were still part of the single market, as I think we should be in the event of, of whether we remain or leave. Um, that doesn't yeah, alter our relationship is, with the euro. I does, do want to come does. on to. Can I, can I, can no, I, come I, back I want on to. That? I want to move on, if, if I may, to to, to domestic to, to the domestic implications in the event of a Brexit vote. Now, uh, again, you know, I, I sort of see this picture of you know the prime minister emerging in the event of a Brexit vote. And who knows? It may be a different prime minister. I'm sure they're not going to be talking about this new land where children can choke on balloons and we can recycle our tea bags. They're going to be dealing with the practical economic realities of leaving the European Union. Uh, Do you not... I think earlier you said um, that there's no reason for uncertainty. Do you not agree that if we were to leave the European Union and there was to be that vote, there would be an economic shock? No, and I think, as I said, I think the best you comparator... You don't think there would be an economic the best, shock? The best comparator is with the, uh, is with the Y2K bug. No, and we've heard this... Uh, OK, I've, I've heard your Y2K bug. Right. I'm, I'm, I went I'm not convinced. In fact, your own economic advisor has said leaving the EU would be an economic shock. You don't agree with the Governor of the Bank of England, but you can't explain why. Now, seemingly, you don't agree even with your own economic advisor. Could you please, I, t- please point to any evidence whatsoever beyond argument and yes. beyond a view beyond that argument, tells us you don't there would argument. not be an economic shock in what the event of Brexit? You don't want argument. Well, I'll give you the, the, uh, the most obvious. First of all, Jerry Lyons 
it has been absolutely clear that the uh, EU would benefit massively for us, from UK would benefit massively from uh, Brexit, and it's uh, overwhelmingly the right thing to do. That's his judgment, and I think he's right. Uh, secondly, what is the evidence that uh, there would not be an economic shock? I simply point to you and simply revert to uh, all the arguments that were made at the time of the Euro decision. And there were, there were many people who were saying then that it that would be... I think I am going well, to... I'm going to... I'm going to... I'm going to... I'm going to... We must have heard that about I, I think on the contrary, I think it would galvanise... Order, order, order. And We've heard that argument six or seven times right. as a response. It's a very interesting point, one that people can weigh uh, outside this room. But we have heard it before. You've well, now alluded it to again in response to that question. Even, uh, 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 if you have some new point to make, make further point? please do even, make a even, new point. Even, even the CBI, which got it so wrong about the, the euro, uh, recently said that um, I think they, they had a, a study that came out a couple of days ago in which they predicted what would happen uh, upon a Brexit. And even in their most, which I thought was grossly negative, but even in their most uh, negative scenarios, there were still three million more jobs by 2030. And I don't happen to agree that they're right to be negative. I think that what would happen is that uh, the British economy, British democracy would be galvanised. Well, well and we would take back control over our borders and we would take back control over about £10 billion or £8.5 billion net that we send to Brussels. Well, you, and it's, you, high time, it's high time, frankly, that we did so. You, you, can't, you can't even tell us what, what the Brexit scenario would look like. And I, that, I'm sorry, in, in fact, just the events this week show us that economic forecasts barely last months, let alone decades. So let's not put so too why much... So why stock. are you predicting economic let's, shock? Let's, let's not... Well, your economic advisor has predicted the economic shock, and you don't agree with him, and I think that's an issue you should probably take back at City Hall. He's predicting very but clearly. Let me, let me just take, let me just take, instead of, in, let me just take your, your own view, which I think you, you or at least the, the view at the time. Um, when you were questioned by Andrew Marr, he raised this uh, metaphor of the Nike tick or the Nike swoosh um, to describe what would happen in the event of Brexit, and uh, there and. He said there would be a period, in, presumably in the downward bit of the swoosh, I can draw a diagram if that's helpful, where people would lose their jobs. And you, said it, and you said it's might. It, you said, and you said it might. It might. I think, I think that the risks, but there's are no uncertainty. The, our risks are roughly the same as those of the Y2K millennium bug. And I think that we are talking ourselves into <coughs> needless negativity about this. I, cannot, I, 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 really, I, really, I really think... You consider... We, we, if we, hang on, if we vote, if we vote, no, no, hang on a minute. I've got this, I'm shutting down this Y2K bug stuff. I mean, you keep on falling back on this argument. The Y2, the, the only, the only relevance of the Y2K bug here is that the, there was no evidence for the Y2K bug, and there isn't much evidence for the arguments that you're making. When you look at the there isn't there any evidence for the forward, arguments you're making. When the well. I'll, 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 well, I've cited your economic advisor. I've cited well, your own view given to a German newspaper. Right. Let's instead yeah, turn to an independent report released by the CBI. I know you don't have much time for them, but it was conducted by PwC. And that warned that a vote to leave the EU would cost the British economy £100 billion and 950,000 jobs. How many job losses would it take before you would change your mind again that Britain should be a member of the European Union? Uh, as I say, if you study the, that report... Uh, properly and closely, as I'm sure you have, you'll find that it predicts that there will be three million more jobs, uh, even... By 2030. Even on, as a so result of So people are worried about paying Brexit. the bills in the next two and, years. What's your message and, to them? And I believe that uh, the country as a whole would be £10 billion better off from uh, day one, uh, net, uh, and we would be able to invest that money in uh, projects, in goods in, uh, in services that our country needs. Uh, hang on, hang secondly, on. secondly, we would take back control of our, of our frontiers and we would relieve the colossal pressure on wages, the downward pressure on wages that we well, have I'm not, seen. I'm not such a... Uh, no, no, okay, you, no a that's very, very important. Just, yeah, very, you, you, you're you're asking about whether people would be better off. And I think no, you, I think, I think you, I think you have. Well, and let's talk about I'm jobs. Trying to bring let's you talk back about employment. To, I'm trying let's to talk bring about you, jobs. I'm trying to bring you back to the next two or three years. Let's talk about because it. most families can't plan their finances over. Let's a, talk about. A, let's talk about jobs. Let's talk about families' finances. So how many jobs? I'm not going to. 
How many I'm not going to instruct you to uh, stop interrupting the questioner again. All right. I want Who's you. I want. I order. If we got direct Jacob. answers, I wouldn't have the order. Wes. Wes. Boris, let Wes ask his question, and then try and address your answer to the question, not to what perhaps you might have wanted the question to be. Wes. In the short term, there would be an economic shock. There would naturally be uncer- of course there is, because there's natural uncertainty. Because even if the government, even if the government has a clear position about its platform for renegotiation, which as far as I'm aware it doesn't, we would still have to get the agreement of every other EU member state. That breeds uncertainty and there is risk. And and I'm afraid I put a bit more stock in independent analyses by economists that warn about job losses in the short term. So I'm wondering what work you have done as Mayor of London to look at what would happen to, in terms of jobs in London in the next two to three years and how many job losses of London as it would take, whether that's people losing jobs on the trading floor or the people who clean the trading floor, how, many, talk about how many jobs would be lost in the next two to I, three years? I don't believe and how many job losses I, I, would it take? I, I, I believe, to I believe London, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Street. I believe that the London economy, along with the rest of the UK economy, would benefit from the removal of a huge amount of regulation uh, and red tape. Uh, it would also, I think, benefit many, many Londoners on uh, low incomes who currently uh, have very poor access to services such as uh, the NHS or education or whatever it happens to be, uh, simply because of the pressure on those services from uncontrolled immigration. And I must be very honest about this, uh, I'm pro-immigration, I believe it's a, a good thing, but it is absolutely wrong of politicians to be unable to control those flows. And we've seen, I think the last year for which we have figures, we had 330,000 uh, net immigration into this country. Uh, that has unquestionably exercised, and something I believe you should care about very strongly, and has unquestionably exercised a downwards pressure on the wages of all our constituents. Uh, it has gravely uh, exacerbated the ability, of, made it much more difficult for social services to cope. Uh, it has put huge pressure on public services of all kinds. It is not reasonable for us to, in London or indeed anywhere else in this country, to uh, be asked to uh, cope with that kind of numbers without some sort of measure of control. And it is not reasonable for politicians continually to tell the electorate that they can control it when they can't. And people feel that very strongly. And I think it was Lord Rose who came to this committee and made the point that a Brexit would actually lead to an increase in wages for the low paid. And I think that's something you might bear in mind when you talk about uh, jobs and the impact on jobs of a Brexit. Would you, in the event of Brexit, want Britain to remain part of the single market? And I've given that, that answer single. about then 15 you times. Must surely, then you must surely, but your answers tend, your views tend to change no, from I think, one question I, to another. So I'm just wondering whether further down, further down the track, uh, you know, if we've negotiated Britain taking part in the single market, you accept that we may still be subject to European regulations. They may still insist on freedom of movement as a principle. No. And even if they didn't, a country like ours <laughs> and a city like London is still reliant on immigration to drive its economy. But controlled immigration. And it is totally wrong that politicians should uh, continually tell their electorates that they can control numbers when they can't. There's no reason at all why this country shouldn't be able to continue to attract talented people but uh, without having a, an open door uh, policy. Uh, this is, the whole argument has changed very much over the last uh, 20 years or so. Because before Maastricht, Basically, that you, you were able to move to another EU country if you were in search of, uh, if you had a job to go to. When I went to work on the continent, I had to go and report to the, uh, to the commune, I had to show evidence that I had a job, uh, and all the rest of it. That is no longer the case under the doctrine of, of European citizenship. Anybody can travel around in search of work and indeed, as you know, to re- receive uh, benefits and uh, that is leading to colossal pressures across the EU. And it is uh, when you have a free travel area, a gigantic free travel area, and you have huge difficulties <coughs> of controlling immigration coming in uh, to the EU zone, then you are making life really, really difficult for uh, for government at all levels. 
I just, I just, I just want to finish then on, on the on the issue of trust. Um, firstly, I mean, are you not concerned that if we were to leave the European Union, but still be subjected to EU regulations and still be yeah. and, and that, let me just finish and make this point: we were still subjected to EU regulations, and there was still inward migration to drive the economy. Are you not concerned that people who are voting to leave the European Union on the basis of sovereignty and immigration might feel cheated? And the second thing, and, 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 and I'll give you a chance on the second. The second thing I'm interested in is whatever criticisms I may have about the facts that you've put across or lack of facts in answers. I don't think many people would doubt that this morning you've put across an enthusiastic and rather passionate case for leaving the European Union. Do you not understand why? Many of us find it hard to believe that passion and believe your authenticity when, over the course of your political career, you've been making very different arguments. Rubbish. Uh, I, I haven't. And I've all, I think if there is no... I, to answer your, your second point first, uh, I don't think there is... I don't think it would be hard-pushed to find a single uh, British politician or journalist who has written more about the failures of democracy in the EU over the last 30 years than me. I really don't think... It, Pat, with the possible exception of Daniel Hannan, I don't think there is a single one, and I resent it very much. I've, I've given you my explanation uh, of what I think has gone wrong and is going wrong with the European Union. This thing is out of control. It is totally out of control. And what we need to do is take back control, and particularly over the funds and over our, over our borders. And, you know, you, to, if you want my... To, I've perhaps, uh, somebody sent me a cutting from 25 years ago, which predicted, uh, Daily Telegraph, Thursday, January the 17th, 1991, which predicted the EC was facing 800,000 <coughs> immigrants a year. And uh, it, I, I, as, I, as I reported, it, it, as 1992 draws near, the issue is becoming increasingly sensitive amongst member states. France shares British anxieties that abolition of frontier checks could see migrant workers wandering unchecked from Czechoslovakia to Spain, from Algeria to London. Uh, that, was, that was 25 years ago that I, it was the same time that Andrew was writing about uh, how you needed a, a single currency to complete a single market, uh, I was accurately, accurately predicting what would happen in a border-free Europe. And as, as, your, as your first point about uh, what would happen uh, post-Brexit and, and what we do with our, uh, what we do with our, our frontiers, you know, there is no reason at all why you should not be able to have free trade as exists, as I say, from Iceland to uh, the borders with Russia without having uh, free movement in the way that we currently have it. It didn't actually exist before Maastricht anyway. Why, why is it necessary? It is, a, it, is a, it is not the law of the Medes and the Persians. There's no reason why we should have it. Um, when you spoke in the House of Commons in 2003, which is a bit more recent. I have the strong impression from that reading that speech that you were strongly supportive of enlargement and the immigration that came with it. Do I take it that you've changed your view? I was supportive of enlargement because it was then the uh, view of the government that, uh, and I thought rightly, it was then the British view, that if we widened the EU, it would somehow become a more tenuous relationship. It would be based more, it would be a, a looser uh, arrangement. And what's happened instead is that the uh, widening of the EU has seen an intensification of the dominance of Germany. That is the, uh, let's be totally clear about what has happened. Uh, the, the whole federal structure has, has accentuated German preponderance within, uh, within Europe. As for, as for, Migrants, I'm just, I'm just trying migrants to clarify from the, from whether the your EU view has changed with respect to that <coughs> enlargement and the associated immigration. I would not have, for instance, I, I think it was, uh, it was the Blair government that decided uh, prematurely to allow the EU accession countries to have uh, free movement. And I, I don't think that, that in order to, to get rid of the derogation, as I recall, I don't think that was I'm, the. I'm just trying the to right clarify to whether, because you did say it's rubbish that you changed your view earlier, and I, I'm just looking at what you actually said in 2003, which is not that long ago. You said it is hard to think of a measure. This is the measure uh, for the introduction of ten countries into the EU. Uh, 
uh, including the A8 uh, East uh, European member states. Think of a measure the government could have brought to the House that I could support more unreservedly and with more pleasure. Of course. Uh, and you also said quite this recently, is... um, for the life of me, I cannot see the economic logic of restricting immigration on the grounds that it increases house prices. Well, I think there are plenty of reasons to... I think the, there are plenty of pressures that uh, the uh, immigration puts on all kinds of services. And I think the point I was, I was making there was about uh, the impact of uh, foreign buyers on the London market. And I, you know, I think that has, been, that has been grossly exaggerated. What, I, what, is, what is certainly the case is that if you look at uh, welfare, if you look at the NHS, uh, if you look at wages at the, at the bottom end, there's been huge pressures caused by immigration. And I think what nobody wanted to see I'm just, we're, uh, the, was... Quite, the what, question that I'm asking you, though, is quite straightforward. I'm sorry to interrupt. It's because we hope to finish at 12, and we have three more colleagues who want to come in. You did say it was rubbish that you changed your view. And I'm just trying to clarify whether what you feel you're now saying about immigration constitutes clarification. I'm in favour of immigration, but I'm in favour of controlled immigration. And that's what you meant when you said you support unreservedly the expansion of the EU. Yes, you, because... Even though there were no proposals for control on the table at the no, time. No, it was the Blair government, it was the Blair government, as I recall, that decided to ditch the derogations yes. uh, and allow unfettered, so you were, unfettered immigration. You and, were that, and that, I think, was You were mistake. assuming at the time you said that, that somehow a derogation would appear. No, there were already, there was other countries exercised it. No, other countries, as you For recall, us. other countries decided, Mr. Tari, uh, to protect themselves against such flows and uh, continue to have the derogation. We, did, something we, others we chose not to. Uh, Helen's got one point she just wants to come back to, and then I'll bring in John Mann. And I do have two further colleagues who want to get in, if possible, for the PMQ, but we will run over if necessary. Helen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, you said that the CBI document claimed that after Brexit, three million jobs would be created, but that's not what it says. It says, in the short term, our results suggest that employment levels fall. Over the longer term, total UK employment could be <coughs> around 350 to 600,000 lower in our two exit scenarios relative to remaining in the EU. Can That's I? what they say. They do not say <coughs> that it will increase by 3 million, Mr Johnson. They, well, it does. What you've got to do, um, is you've got to combine tables 4.1 and tables 5.5. Uh, I leave that to your ingenuity. Um, and that, that is, and you will see that even in the worst case scenario, there is a gain. I'm not gain sure of. that you're quite as on top of those tables as you appear, since I know that you're reading from a scrap which has been passed to you from well, uh, you your, your economy. I noticed you've been constantly conferring I, with I, some I, chat sitting on your left. I, you know, <laughs> source... Yeah. I quite understand that you might not have the table 4.1 and 4.6 of your fingertips, but we will now take a look at them and come back to it if necessary before the end of the hearing. John Mann. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, Mr Johnson, I had the, uh, the pleasure of hearing your 2003 speech. In fact, it was the first time I'd heard you speak. And you also said then, um, if we didn't have a European Union, we would inv invent something like it overnight. I appreciate people do change well, their... I think overnight their, is... It was overnight the most... Is, well, that's, was that's the most the it was the most pro-European speech, a far too pro-European for my liking, um, that I'd heard in Parliament to that time, very much in tune uh, with the mood of Mr Blair and his government at the time. Um, uh, but it's interesting to see how people change their views. But I wanted to just hone in on one of the things you'd said that I thought was inappropriate. This is, under British law, uh, a sitting of a parliamentary select committee. The Governor of the Bank of England has a remit, indeed a contract. He's not allowed to make political comments. Um, I would judge that if you to make political commentary, uh, that would be a sackable offence. You have said that he's made political commentary. And I give, you the, I give you the opportunity, Mr Johnson. I didn't say that. I I you say, you, you, Mr Johnson, you said um, that the Governor of the Bank of England has made political commentary in relation to what he said to this committee. And I just give you the opportunity, just to correct the record which exists verbatim, um, to correct the record, which what you meant to say was the Governor of the Bank of England 
made appropriate economic commentary as he thought fit. Would you like to correct the record? Well, I, I'd like to see the, what the record says, first of all. But my memory of what I said was that the Governor of the Bank of England was at perfect liberty to say what he wanted. No, you, no, no. Let me, let me be quite clear, because I wrote it down at the time. You said political comments. That's how you described the Governor of the Bank of England. And yeah. I'm giving you the opportunity... To clarify and to correct the record, if you don't wish to, that stands. Well, I, I'd love to see the record before I... Well, well, that's an answer. I'm grateful to you for, I'm grateful to you for is, writing down the words political comment. Um, it doesn't seem to me to represent a, a very accurate shorthand well, note of what I, well, well, what well, I said. Well, well, there is a verbatim tape and record of, of the proceedings. We will see what you said. In my view, your commentary is wholly inappropriate to a committee like this. It is a sackable offence, but we'll see where that takes us in the future. I think now, you, I think, you, I think you also will. referred to the Canadian, uh, 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 and, and you said on the 11th of March, uh, we can be like Canada. Um, you said in relation to the Canadian uh, agreement, I'm quoting you again, um, that it's uh, an attraction with the wholesale removal of tariffs. You also suggested that we might need a deeper relationship than Canada has because of our 44 years. In that Canadian agreement, what is the single big stumbling block that's led to Prime Minister Harper not being able to sign it during his tenure? Well, I think one of the, the biggest difficulties is obviously that uh, Canada has a... Uh, very different history. No, 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 there's only one with... big stumbling block. Um, I'm sure you've studied what's gone on in Canada, it's contemporary. There's only been one stumbling block to this agreement for Prime Minister Harper. I'm asking you if you're aware what that stumbling block is. Well, uh, as we must let Boris I, I, now I'm, answer the question. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to say, I, the, the attractions of the Canadian agreement from my point of view are that it gives free trade in uh, a huge number of areas, it removes 98% of of, of tariffs, as, I, as I've said before, I don't consider it be the, to be the perfect model for what we need to achieve. What we need is a British deal. The reason that Prime Minister Harper couldn't sign it is, and the reason it's taken seven years, still not uh, enacted, it is because the EU insisted in those negotiations that the Charter for Fundamental Human Rights be included. That's the reason Prime Minister Harper refused to sign it, though in fact in it there are significant factors relating to, 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 to human rights. This small agreement, how long is it? Well, What's the length uh, of the agreement? Say, I'm, I, I, it's you, if I may say so, Mr Mann, who seem to uh, attach uh, such great significance to the, uh, the candidate. I was merely, no, I was merely, I was merely isolating March. one attraction of it. It's and it is, and one, you know, one, one thing I might point out, is that it is absurd? To, you know, it is, it is absurd for us currently to be. Uh, well, my question is, how long is the agreement? You're here as an expert witness. I'm trying to prey on your expertise. How long is the Canadian agreement? I'm, I'm sorry to say, I can't tell you how long. Have the you Canadian read the Canadian agreement? Agreement, agreement, agreement is. Have, you read, is I'm have you read the Canadian agreement? I, it is you, Mr. Man. It is you. Are you who aware of the name of the Canadian agreement? You who attach such great significance I, to the Canadian agreement. Are you aware of the name of the Canadian agreement? That you've cited. What I want is a You're deal. You're not for aware Britain. of the name of the Canadian agreement. I'm not agreement. interested in a, in a, You're in not a, aware in a of deal its length. that uh, has defects of the Are you aware of its <coughs> content? It gets rid of 98% of tariffs, and that seems to me to be. Are you aware of its content on human rights? Well, you've just mentioned no. that. It's 598. And, and if I may pages. say so, you're rather making my point, if I, because uh, I think that uh, it is absurd that the EU should be introducing such requirements into international well, well, trade I, well, let's, let, well, let's, let's go to tariffs. Mad. And let's go into absolutely tariffs. Absolutely mad. Clause uh, 211. Uh, just, just Boris, is, uh, I just, we just need to have Boris's reply to the specific point that John made, and then we'll yes, come back I, I just, to it. If you I'm could very, be brief, I'm, be helpful. I, I have to say, I think it is absurd that the uh, obstacle to the uh, EU-Canada trade agreement should have been the Charter of Fundamental Right, so if indeed I'm taking the, this from you, Mr. Mann, if indeed that is the, the case, uh, I see no reason why uh, the Charter should be such an obstacle. Uh, it seems t t totally irrelevant to uh, our trade concerns. Anybody who studied the, the 55 articles of the Charter of, of, of Fundamental Rights will know that uh, there are, some of them are very peculiar 
indeed. Uh, they go way beyond the normal understanding of, of human rights. Uh, why on earth the EU, uh, the Commission, uh, feels it necessary to use this as the, as the basis for trade negotiations is beyond me. But, but and, it, and, but it, but it I, does I in the current totally, trade... Totally but inappropriate. Does, but it does in the current trade negotiations ongoing with Canada. And, now, and, and totally to, wrong. And, one of the, and, and it shows... Why I mean, Mr. Been, Mann, it shows why, uh, if uh, I may say so, Boris, it shows why we need order, to be negotiating order, our own order, deals. Boris. John, no. have a go, no. and then... No, 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 what it shows is what the negotiating stance of the Euro Commi European Commission is, and why it took the Canadians, who had a similar approach to you, why it took them seven years to negotiate. Now, Clause 211.3 of the Canadian Agreement says um, uh, that Canadian products can only be imported and sold in the EU if they fully respect the EU regulations without any exemption. So the EU, in their current negotiations, is requiring full acceptance of EU regulations to allow Canadian products into the EU. That's their negotiating stance. I hesitate to, sorry, you know, I hesitate to uh, be you know, remotely uh, disrespectful to this committee. But, of course, uh, if you want to sell into a domestic market, uh, you have to make sure that your goods comply the domestic, those domestic requirements, and that's the case for uh, the US exporting to the EU or Switzerland exporting to the EU. One of the interesting things, actually, is that in spite of not being a member of the so-called single market, the US, the United States, has seen a much bigger increase in its exports uh, per capita to uh, the EU than we have, and uh, the same is true also of, of Switzerland. Uh, as I say, countries don't trade with countries. People trade with people. Uh, businesses trade with businesses. And they will continue to do so uh, at, uh, to and, a huge extent. And countries put up tariffs. So you raised the uh, Animal Byproducts Directive 2002. What's your assessment of the AXIC negotiations ongoing with China? Of the which negotiations? The AXIC negotiations ongoing with China. Well, it's, I, you know... If you're talking about the EU-China... No, no, I'm talking about the British AXI negotiations. Well, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't give you uh, an informed commentary on that, except to say that uh, I think it's very sad that we are currently unable to do a free trade deal with China because that power, that competence, has been given to the, to the EU. Well, no, China refuses uh, to do any specific negotiations with the UK on it at the moment. I'm meeting the Secretary of State... Uh, in two weeks' time on the very issue could it affect well, I'm jobs sure, I'm sure in our area. Now, the, the Animal Byproducts Directive, you happen to, to quote that. Which country initiated that? Well, I'm I, sorry, I can't tell you. You, can't, but you came in in 2001, same time as me. You can't recall what happened when we came in. Well, that I'm, might I'm, lead to the British government wanting to propose an animal I'm sorry, yes, of course, it was foot and mouth. It was foot and mouth. Foot and mouth? Yes. So why did that directive get brought in at the behest of the British government? Well, uh, of course, because we wanted, as I recall, to uh, restore trade in uh, British beef uh, and in British uh, livestock with, with uh, the rest of the EU. And uh, we, were the, we were keen to... Uh, persuade them to accept our, our beef. And as I recall, and it was as I recall, they didn't. Uh, and actually, in spite of our membership, in spite of our membership of the EU, Mr. Mann, they kept out our beef. No, no, no. And in spite of the animal, they, they did. The, 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 uh, illegally. And, and the, the directive uh, in, a, in a highly discriminatory way the directive, that affected our farmers and our businesses. The directive came in at DEFRA's request in order... Um, that we and, could and, and let me get ask you: Did the French going, yeah. drop their ban? No, you, you, when did the French you, drop their ban? You cited, you cited that as an example of terrible regulation, but in fact, that regulation, which yes. you did not vote or argue against in Parliament, was precisely to tackle tariff barriers I'm so sorry, I don't think, to our industry. I, don't, I think possibly you weren't here at the beginning of this. Uh, conversation, which was only a couple of hours ago, but uh, what, what, hap what the chairman, Mr. Tari, said was that there was no evidence to suppose that you couldn't recycle tea bags. And I pointed out that this uh, resulted from Cardiff Council 
manically over-interpreting an EU directive. I made no comment on the rights and wrongs of that directive, which were related, as you rightly say, to, uh, to BSE. What I, what I commented on, well, well, what again, I commented the Trump, the Trump, on was the, Trump, the ludicrous gold plating of that directive and the, and the, the behaviour of Cardiff Council. The, the beauty, and I think the record will reflect the, that, the, the, Mr the, Mack. The beauty, Mr Johnson, of these hearings <laughs> is there is a record of them. I know. That's, that's the beauty. So if any expert witness is inconsistent, then that can be seen by I think you will find the, that I have been that perfectly be seen Now, of, I think go, of, go of, back of and the and statutory and instruments, you say that there are 2,500 a year. You've been in Parliament for six or seven, about six years, I think. Um, came in the same day as me. Well, I've been. So, I, how I'm, many? I, I've been how many? Well, how many have you? How many have you voted against? I, I, I've been out of Parliament for, for, for a while. Uh, but you I, were in. in for, you've been in for about six years. In the period I've been in, starting the same day. How many of the? That would be around fifteen thousand. You're claiming in the period you've been in Parliament. How many have you voted against? Many of them, as you as you know, well, how many? Can, cannot be uh, fourteen thousand. Can, cannot be voted against at all. Ten thousand. Because they go through. They go through. I, I used to serve on something called European Standing Committee B, and it was a completely pointless yeah. exercise yeah. And, because and there is absolutely nothing this part this Parliament can do to stop the vast majority of this stuff. It's absolutely any, true. Any member, it, it goes through. Any it member, goes through on the nod. Any we, member, there was just nothing just we could just do. Let Boris finish. It, it was, goes through I, on the nod. Goes through, there was nothing we could do to stop. I remember being on the European Standing Committee and asking whether, whether there was anything we could do practically to stop the stuff we were effectively rubber stamping, and there wasn't. Any member and, can any member can attempt to force a vote on any issue in here. So I am asking you on how many occasions out of these 15,000 you have attempted by vote or by speaking to block them of the 15,000. Uh, well, if, I certainly, if, if we I, do I certainly when I was on the European Standing Committee, I'd have to go back and look at what I said, but I certainly remember being appalled by some of the things that we were being asked to rubber stamp, but it was made clear to me that that was a position we were in, uh, the, this stuff had to go through the House of Commons, and there was very little, uh, in fact, nothing that we could do about it because of the supremacy of European law so, so under, fact, under okay. the uh, 1972 European Union. So the answer is you've hardly forced any votes. You've hardly forced any votes on any of them during your period of time in here. Because it would have made absolutely no difference whatever. As you know fine well, Mr Mann, and I think it is absolutely absurd to pretend otherwise. This House has no ability to stop European legislation or, or indeed statutory instruments. It's an important and clear exchange on that, and we've got your point on, on that issue, which is well made. I think many of us uh, have some sympathy with the point that you're making. But I do want to pick up on one of the agriculture points that uh, John Mann made and bring in George Caravan uh, at this point. Thank you, Chair. Good uh, morning. And I've mm. uh, more no, I think this is a marathon. This is, this is turning to a European Agriculture Council. <laughs> but, uh, is, uh, uh, let us have an all-nighter. Part of Fisheries the, Council. It's called the Select Committee. Part of the reason, of course, Boris, is that you do uh, occupy the odd minute or two in the sidelines of our conversations with the remarks of exactly that kind. George Caravan. Um, at your um, now famous uh, Dartford Vote Leave launch, you said that uh, the common agricultural policy was demented, and it adds about £400 a year to the cost of food for every household in the country. Now, could you clarify, are, you, are we to take from that that if Britain votes to leave the EU, the average household will be £400 better off in some direct way? I think that uh, in, there would be some reductions in uh, the cost of food made possible by getting rid of some bureaucracy and some provisions in the current CAP system. Let me put a number on it. Let me, let me, let me, let me, the number, the number, the number let me, was strategically let me, used, so I'm just trying let me, let me, to get let, the number clear. So let me give you a full, a full, a full answer, Mr. Mr. Caravan. Um, I think it is very important for my side of the argument to stress that we believe in subsidising agriculture and in supporting agriculture. Uh, there would be 
I, I don't think it'd be reasonable to expect British agriculture to survive uh, without direct support. What, what we're advocating I appreciate is, that, I'm just is, trying a re, to is a repatriation. The number, the number. You used a specific number, which got a lot of publicity. Um, it may be right, it may be wrong. I'm just trying to clarify. So are you saying it's not 400? If we leave, what, 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 what is the saving? I think, I think the extra, the extra cost of food as a result of the uh, of the CAP has for a long time been put at about £400 pounds, uh, per By year whom? Per, per family. By whom? Uh, I'm, I'd be very happy to write to you with the, the provenance of that uh, statistic, but that is a, certainly a statistic that I've read for a long, for a long time. I'm trying to find out what that statistic was before making it in a speech like that. Well, uh, Mr. Caravan, I would be very happy to supply you and Mr. Tari with the origins of it, but if you, if you think about it, uh, for a second, you can you can see that uh, if you support uh, agriculture in all sorts of ways through subsidies and through uh, through tariffs, uh, there will be an extra cost. The question uh, for us is: Is the CAP efficient? So, so four hundred is, is misleading. Is, is, is four hundred is misleading because it's, it's not it's not what people is the say. CAP efficient in no, uh, the, way it, the way that we're going off on a We're trying to clarify. I'm trying to be as specific as yeah, possible. We have a number. Be, you use, you introduce the number. You don't know where it came from. I'm trying to have, so is it a four hundred pound saving? Is it three hundred and two hundred? Or do you know? I didn't look. I, let's be let's be very clear. There is there is a cost to the you consumer. You used a specific number two yes. weeks ago. You don't yes. know where it came from. There is a cost. And now to you're the telling me that it wouldn't be four hundred. It would be less than that because well, you've be spoken subsidy. about a saving. I was speaking about a cost. You said there was four hundred pound cost. At the moment, you use the number. If we leave, I'm asking. Do we save that 400, wherever it came uh, from? Uh, my, answer, my answer is we wouldn't save all that 400. How much? We would save some, I, I can't give you that figure. Right. But what, what we would certainly uh, continue... Does the 400 is, include... We would certainly continue support for agriculture. Right, fine. And all farmers would receive, yeah. uh, would continue to receive uh, the current levels of subsidy. And we'd need, and we'd need oh, to make fine. sure... So we'd current need to levels make, of subsidy. We'd need to make sure that was, that was baked in very firmly and that... And that, that uh, uh, Stewardship payments, deficiency payments, payments uh, for do you, uh, but by current, current, will current, be the current level. Do you mean by that the amount that, um, it, as well as UK subsidy to farming and fishing, do you mean the the, the, the net, the, the the money that comes from Europe, money goes out, money comes back in? About three thousand, about three billion pounds a year I mean, goes to British farmers from EU. We would maintain that. Yes, but don't forget that there would be massive saving in the form of, I and mean, I think from, the, from the, the FIOGA budget, or the European Agricultural Guidance Fund, uh, is something to which we are huge net contributors. We we pay in much more than we get back. Uh, the we would save. I think the the net contribution on on FIOGA is about. Um, something like four billion. I'd, ha I'd have to check the check the figures. It's a very considerable uh, net payment we make into the European agricultural system. There will be more funds available for uh, support of other uh, vital services in this country, and indeed for and and and. But from my point, I think everybody does understand. There is there are huge I sums. I appreciate your editorial to, comment as a journalist, right? Um, the 400 which you have used, which is constantly used, it comes from the Taxpayers' Alliance, and it comes from data which is seven or eight years old, so it's quite whiskery. And it does not include netting back the money that comes to British farmers, which is about three billion a year. So I think even, even in its own, even if it, even in its own grounds, that 400 is misleading well, because misleading. it does not. It is misleading because it does not include the money that comes back. To British farmers, British yes, farmers. but as, as I think I've, as I've tried laboriously to point out, at uh, the, the moment, if you look at the Office of National Statistics figures, we contribute gross about twenty uh, billion. We get back in through either through the agricultural funds or through structural funds or regional funds or whatever uh, about, um, and through the abatement, uh, we get back about uh, ten billion pounds. I'm glad you understand that. So the four hundred figure and, is, and so, and so, is misleading. And so, there, so there is doesn't scope. include that. So there is scope for a colossal saving uh, for British right. taxpayers. But, but I, and, I understand that. that, that. Well, I'm glad you understand no, that because no, that's a vital point. It is a vital point. So the vital point 
now that, now that you've explained that you understand that farmers get money back from the CAP, yes. is that the £400 which you are using, which doesn't include allowance for that net back, that is, it, that is an exaggerated figure? No, it's the, it's the extra cost of, as a result of the CAP, and it partly reflects, in my view, but the, you get money the, additional, you get money the back. additional bureaucracy of uh, the CAP system with its uh, price support intervention, export refunds, uh, all sorts of uh, mechanisms that I think are exceedingly inefficient. And uh, I think it would be possible to have strong domestic support for farmers to repatriate uh, the CAP in such a way as to support British farmers uh, in a way that they need to deserve. How would you change the support system? Well, I think you'd, you, you, what you wouldn't do is, uh, in my view, the, the EU is, is party to um, witting uh, evil in the way that it discriminates against uh, manufacture, against uh, agricultural products from sub-Saharan Africa. For instance, I think that uh, there, are, there are goods that would, uh, would benefit families in this country that come from uh, markets that are currently uh, prevented from exporting to us by the, by the, e, by the external uh, okay, EU yes. tariff, and I think that that's something that people should care about very much. Um, I think that uh, the, the whole system of intervention, of price intervention, uh, although they've moved away from that a great deal, is still... Uh, Crazy. The idea. Now, that I was you asking you what, you, what, what, what your system would be. Well, my system would be one of basically of, uh, of Farmgate. Uh, I mean, you know, be. I mean, this is something that, obviously, uh, you know, uh, would be a matter for government and parliament to decide. But uh, so you don't my, know. What my, you, my preference would be for deficiency payments, for Farmgate payments that uh, were, were baked in, that supported agriculture in the way it needs to be supported. And also uh, stewardship payments as well, because I think many, many farmers uh, need uh, support for looking after the land uh, and not just for producing. But no less uh, than at, at present. And I absolutely vital to get across, uh, thank you Mr Caraman for this question, vital to get across that it would be uh, at the level uh, that they currently enjoy and uh, that level of support would be perpetuated. So actually, the four hundred pounds. No, because I, as I think, no, because as I've said, the, the EU system, the, the CAP, involves all sorts of mechanisms, uh, such as intervention support for prices, but, but, such but as the, tariffs. The bulk, the, bu- uh, the bulk, the I mean, bulk, uh, the bulk uh, of the there is, a, there is a business the bulk in is, is the is the is the, subsequent the business in there is a business <coughs> in in London. The the, the CAP. Before the CAP was invented, I, th- I think uh, Portugal didn't even have a sugar beet industry. We're not talking about Portugal. We're and, about, uh, and the result has been talking about British the, the EU, EU sugar, the EU sugar regime has done fantastic damage to the interests of UK uh, sugar cane producers. Uh, the, the one particular, obviously, Tate and Lyle, uh, which I represent in, in London, facing huge problems because of the EU's uh, approach. Uh, they would be totally liberated by uh, by Brexit. Let's move on. And, and sugar cane Let's producers on, in can. poor countries around the world would benefit. Right, you made the point. Um, okay, we have left the EU. Let's, let's, let's move on to that scenario. Um, you, you've said on, on several points uh, this morning that uh, there's actually there, there's an existing free trade area across the whole of Europe, from Iceland to the Russian border. That's not true, because agriculture is not subject to free trade across that whole area. If the UK left, um, we would then face the tariff barriers on, on food and agricultural products uh, for, by being outside, which you've mentioned. Um, Why? Wouldn't that, because, the, because the EU applies the very tariffs that you've just mentioned that you knew about. They apply to Norway. So we would. Have, so are you saying we, we would? We, we would, unlike. The, the no, way you, you we negotiate. Would, you're saying we would. We would have to negotiate free trade access for agricultural products. I think the, the, you know, the, given the the huge uh, exports of agricultural products to this country from the EU, uh, from other from the rest of the EU, uh, they'd be insane not to uh, do a deal with us involving free trade and agricultural. Products. And as for, as for but they would then um, require uh, access uh, 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 acceding to the cap rules. No, why? I don't see why that. As I, we've, we've already discussed uh, free trade agreements that the EU has done uh, with other third parties. I see no reason at all why there shouldn't be uh, free trade. Uh, in French farmers might see a reason. 
Well, uh, they might, but on the other hand, they might not want their wine or their camembert to face discrimination in this country. So you would, you would advocate counter-tariffs if the EU... Puts no, I, think, uh, well, I, I don't think there would be a need for any such thing. I don't what? think there would be need for tariffs or for counter-tariffs. And I, 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 think it, I think it's just an increasingly primitive way of thinking about the world. Britain is global. Where, where we should be trading globally. I'm not advocating, and I'm just suggesting that, that if you take the, the concrete example we have of Norway, Norwegian products face tariffs, because, because Norway is, is in the, the, the economic area, but not within the EU, though it has free trade in manufactured goods, it does not have free trade in agricultural products. They're, they are subject to the same tariff barriers that the EU puts to everyone else. If we are out of the EU, we face those tariff barriers unless you can negotiate them away. I think it's reasonable to assume that part of negotiating those away, if that was possible, would be accepting the rules, common rules, for the agricultural policy. So you wouldn't get rid of that. So it's either out and face the tariff barriers with the Europe for, for food products, or in and face and keep the... the uh, I, 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 don't, I don't follow you, and I, don't agree. I think it's a non-sequitur. I don't think that's true. Um, I think that, yes, we would want to keep free access, and I think it would be overwhelmingly in the interests of the rest of the EU to, to do so. Uh, However, there is no reason, I think, for us to be part of the CAP, where, whereby we have this extraordinary system where you, you send in a huge check to, uh, to Brussels. Uh, that gets dissipated on all sorts of farm support schemes around the EU, and you get a, small, a much smaller amount back for the support of your own agriculture. What we would have is a, a system whereby we were able to uh, support our agriculture and indeed to support it more generously thanks to the massive saving that we were making. So you want to spend more on agricultural subjects? On si in some areas you might want to be more supportive, on some areas you might want to think, uh, you know, I think m many people would say that uh, some of the, the big barley barons have done very well out of the CAP over the last uh, 25 years, and, and you might consider uh, exactly how uh, you wanted to, uh, to, to develop your, your programme, but so as to be the benefit of, uh, of all producers in this country. Will you use the £400... Some again when you're speaking. I think it's. Uh, it, it, I'm, I'm grateful to you for, uh, for bringing it up. I think it's a it's a it's a handy reference point for uh, the effect on prices of the, of the CAP. Uh, what I'm saying to you. But you can't justify what, the number. What, well, you you said that the Taxpayers Alliance uh, has produced that number, and, and that's their calculation. Uh, what I what I'm saying to you is that there is, in my view, ample scope for savings on bureaucracy and the whole weird architecture of the CAP, how but much? also, but also, uh, well, if you want to, if you want to, how much we can save on well, our you've, you've net contributions to Brussels. Is pen, so I'll just ask what the number is. All right. Um, uh, overall, we can, I think, from memory, we contribute, I think we contribute about 6.5 billion to, to, to the FIOGA budget and get about 4 billion back, I think. I would have to check those figures. Um, that's a saving of about 2.5 billion. So, you, okay, exactly. we've, we've made some progress in that exchange. We've got Chris Philp, who wants to come in. I'm sorry that this is going on so long. No, I love it. I mean, come on. Boris, I'm very pleased that you I mean, are. It's a, such an honour to be here. And, uh, that uh, you're taking that view. It's not the longest session we've had, but it is. It's, <coughs> you, you, you've got some way to get to the record, but I'm sure you're looking forward to. Uh, uh, well, I just admire the indefatigability of our, of, our, of, our, of our... Chris, far yes, away. And indeed of your committee, some of whom have deserted... Sorry, Chris. Indeed. No, 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 carry on, carry on. Well, look, thank you for joining us this morning, Boris, and thank you for your patience, which has been uh, exceptional and goes, uh, I think, above and beyond the call of any sort of duty, so thank you. Um, I'd like to just start um, by talking about some of the future prospects for the European Union if we stay in which have been held out to us as, as uh, one might say, carrots or as inducements. Um, one of the provisions in the, the deal that was struck um, a few weeks ago was that uh, on a regular basis, um, competence would be reviewed uh, with a view to returning some to the United Kingdom or to member states where possible. Bearing in mind your long experience of the Brussels machine, um, how likely do you think it is um, that were we to stay in, there would be any sort of return of competence or sovereignty? Well, I, I'm grateful for that because I think this goes to the heart of what we're talking about with the development of the single market. I think it was uh, Rachel Reeves who said, you know, that we weren't in the, in the euro and therefore we didn't have to, uh, to, to worry about the way things were, were going. And I, I have to say, I don't take that view. And one of the reasons uh, that 
my attitude has changed, perhaps, Mr. Mann, from uh, that speech I made in, in 2003, which is before the Lisbon summit and before uh, the, uh, the Euro experiment got so out of hand. I think that the five presidents' report shows very clearly they're bent on uh, more integration of uh, social policy, of company law, of uh, all sorts of areas of, of property rights, uh, all sorts of things that have not hitherto been thought necessary for uh, the functioning of the, of the monetary union, but which I think will inevitably have, an, and it, avowedly they want to do it through the, the, the single market. And I think that will, that will amp- impact on us. And I don't, uh, Chris, see any prospect at all the, uh, post, you know, in, that, in that context of, of a repatriation of powers to our country. That's just not going to happen. You've seen what happened in the, in the renegotiation. We got absolutely zilch, I mean, you know, effectively. Uh, and I think that's, that's the, the best we can hope for. Do you, do you draw any comfort from our exemption from the ever closer union, or do you think that's just a sort of well, uh, platitude? Well, no, I mean, it, it, look, I don't want to, I don't want to, to minimise uh, that. Uh, it, it is a, it's something, it's, but it's, you know, there, there are very few cases before the European uh, Court of Justice, which, or very few times which the Court of Justice has actually relied <coughs> on, on that provision uh, to form its, uh, its federalising judgments, and actually, most times it is very, very federalising anyway, very, very centralising anyway. It doesn't, it doesn't need to have recourse to, to that. So I, I, I think it's, 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 you know, it's, a, it's a nice symbol, but it's not of any of, of much practical assistance. And to ask a similar question, there's, a, there's also a provision in the arrangement to look at uh, removing regulations, I think, on a, there'll be an annual review and they'll look at what regulations they can um, cancel. I think I established in questioning um, the Commissioner, Lord Hill, a few weeks ago, um, that so far, um, not a single regulation he is aware of has ever been repealed. It's always a one-way street. Um, so, in a similar vein, do you have any uh, expectation that um, if we did stay inside and if the British government sort of battled energetically, we might be able to get some regulations taken away well, from I think, the inside? I, mean, I don't want to contradict uh, Lord Hill, um, but I, I, my, you know, I think that the EU does technically... Um, Repeal measures, and insofar as they're replaced by mm. by new ones, so I think that you know they will argue that there's been uh, some that have been uh, repealed. Uh, but in in the course of their sort of subsidiarity campaign to get rid of stuff where they think that they've been uh, ultra vares, virtually nothing has has happened, and I don't see any prospect of that happening. You know, we not a single part of the you know where is the aki. The, the, the corpus of European law, where has it been winnowed down as, as a result of, of British intervention? I, I, I'm afraid I can't see it. And so this, we fundamentally got something that is, is not suitable for us. It is a political union, and the time has come, I think, for us to say the Emperor's got no clothes and, and call a halt. Okay, you don't think we can stand inside the European Union uh, participating in the single market fully? but standing to one side from the political projects, the ever closer union, the single no. currency and so on. No, I mean, I think, I think that there are, it is so fundamentally dishonest of us to keep pretending that we are able to be in it just for free trade and for nothing else. This is a, an avowedly political project. They want to create a single uh, polity. Uh, that is what they say. Uh, that is what is being achieved by the huge increase in EU law. Mm. Um, I, I think it's time to make a judgment and to say that the only the only way forward is is for us to to make our to value our democracy. This is you know we fought for this. Okay. So it's moving on to the question of immigration, which we briefly touched on in earlier exchanges. Were we to leave? So currently, net immigration is I think it's about three hundred and thirty thousand on most recent figures, of which roughly speaking, very roughly speaking, half is EU, half is non-EU. Were we to leave the EU, what level do you think we could get immigration down to? Well. Um, we, obviously you'd be able to control it much more easily because you wouldn't be constantly uh, you, know, you wouldn't have to admit people just because they have an EU passport and we, we know there are now some places in the EU where you can get travel documents in a way that is not wholly uh, above board and an awful lot of people are coming here you know, without um, any clear you know, job that are already existing. Now, many of them do wonderful things for this country, but if you have uncontrolled immigration of the kind that we've had in the last 10, 15 years or so, 
it will have very serious uh, impacts. And you know, we need to work out as a country what we what we really what is the ultimate size of the UK population? How far are we going to go with this thing? You know, if it goes on like this, it'll be 92 million uh, by 2050. Um, that's an awful lot of people. And we need to think about the, the impacts of that. Most of this will be driven by, by immigration. Um, how are we going to cope? But could, could you, so I think that's a very, um, I understand the point completely, but could you venture a number that people might be able to sort of consider, the net immigration figure we might be able to achieve were we to withdraw? I, I wouldn't want to get in the, you know, because I wouldn't want to, I think that one of the difficulties with this whole thing is that governments endlessly, um, you know, come out with figures that they think are, are, that they're going to be able to achieve and then, and then they disappoint the, the electorate. I think it would be, be unwise to come out with a figure. What I think we could do... Well, I don't know about that. Sorry, sorry. I think he's in the middle of answering. Mr. Tari, we think. Perhaps you'd write to me after saying which of my figures you don't you well, particularly I don't like. I think it's pretty clear which ones they are. I'm sorry, Chris, do carry on. Um, anyway, uh, my my view is that uh, I've seen that I've seen studies saying that you would get it down to fifty thousand uh, a year. I, I'm, In I'm, total. I'm not I'm not I'm not necessarily endorsing those. Um, I I think the difficulty will be um, there's a very large demand from business and industry but you should at least be able to control it you should be able to you should be able to you should be able to decide what type of labor you want uh, do you want skilled labor of a certain kind uh, do you need certain unskilled uh, jobs filled how does it work and at the moment what you've seen is a is a huge huge downward pressure on wages mm-hmm. and uh, that's had a big impact on our country. Then. Of the current inward uh, immigration flow from the EU, roughly what proportion would you characterise as sort of helpful, that is to say high skilled, filling gaps, etc., versus unhelpful, that is to say unskilled and more of a drag? I think the issue is, is really to do with um, control and mm. what, the, what the scope is for UK politicians to take responsibility for what is happening and uh, at the moment it is way out of control and people feel it, they know it, they can see hundreds of thousands of people coming here net every year and uh, yeah. I, don't see, I, don't see, I don't see how we can stand up to the electorate and, and tell them anymore that we can stop this thing when we patently can't. Yeah, I understand. Okay, and, and the final point on immigration, uh, before it's briefly moving on, um, what do you think would happen in a Brexit scenario to those, I, I think it must be three or four million, EU citizens currently living and working in the country? Yeah, I think there are about, um, well, I, I may get this wrong, but I think there are about 2.3 uh, million EU citizens in, in the UK and about 2.2 million UK citizens in the, in the rest of the EU, something like that. I think that. Their rights would be unaffected, and I would hope that um, you know, they would be you know, we, we already have, as, as, as everybody knows, we have huge numbers of, uh, of French people living in, in London, uh, huge numbers of, of people from around the EU. Indeed, we have huge numbers of Americans, huge numbers of Canadians, huge numbers of Australians, uh, Russians. Uh, there, there are all communities with 300 languages on the streets of this city. Um, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think that uh, there would so we'd be any threat to their position. Yeah. So we'd effectively, so as part of our exit negotiation over the two-year period, um, we'd effectively grant grandfathered residency rights to any EU citizen living here, and we'd presumably similarly expect a Brit living in Spain to receive grandfathered residency rights in Spain that would last their lifetime. Absolutely, and, and indeed, those rights, as a, as, as a, to the best of my knowledge, are, uh, are respected under the, the Vienna... Uh, Vienna Treaty. Would, would that not trigger a massive influx of people in that two-year period seeking to acquire those grandfathered rights? Wouldn't we see a huge flood up to and including what, the of, day of when Brits they... coming back? No, 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 no. Of of, East, of people from Europe. So uh-huh. let's say we said anyone who's any EU citizen resident as of let's say the 23rd of June 2018, up to and including that day, gets lifetime grandfather residency rights. But after that, they're subject to whatever controls. The you British mean in government. the period of the, rene- of the negotiation? Yeah, so let's, well, yes. presumably during the two-year period, we continue to be the re- the re- during the renegotiation, which let's say takes two years. Um, we continue to be full members of the EU with all the normal laws applying. Let's say that from the 23rd of June 2018, two years later onwards, we get to control our borders as we see fit. But any EU resident who's pitched up before then would get these grandfathered lifetime residency rights. Wouldn't that, and vice versa for Brits overseas, wouldn't that then create an incentive for every... 
well, person living in Romania that could jump on a plane to come over here before the 20, um, June 18 to get their lifetime rights? Well, uh, I'm, I'm not certain that that is the case, but if it were the case and if it seemed that that was a, a risk, I think you could probably take some steps to prevent it by unilaterally deciding to um, install border controls or, inst in, sorry, in install uh, restrictions on free movement of labour, which is what we're talking about. And, 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 and don't forget that um, this is, to get back to this, this is, this is not something that is as deeply ingrained in the, in the DNA and the religion of the EU as everybody now pretends. This is something that really only arose post Maastricht. Okay, I had, uh, I had one, <coughs> excuse me, final question, because I realise people probably want to get to PMQs, um, although I have taken far less time than anyone else so far. I'm um, sorry. Uh, in terms of this, this debate we've had frequently about the nature of a future um, trade agreement post-Brexit, um, we've talked about Canada and Switzerland and Norway, and you said you'd like to see a, a sort of a British deal that is distinct. A British from deal. All of them. Could, could you just, for the committee's benefit, and indeed yes. the country's benefit, just give a rough sort of um, sketch of how that might look in terms of goods, services, financial services, and any um, sort of countervailing obligations that may get imposed on us, like free movement or even budget contributions? I, I think both of those would be lopped off. But it would be massively for free movement and, and, and budgetary contributions. But it would be massively in the interests of our partners to do a deal based on free trade in, in goods and services. And uh, I'm sure that's what we would achieve. Uh, it's very important to recognise that we would retain the uh, ability to work with our European friends and partners in uh, all the other areas of EU cooperation that matter greatly to this country and to, to Europe. So, on the common foreign and security policy or on home justice and criminal affairs, we would remain active partners, uh, but it would all be done at an intergovernmental level. There'd be no need, as I say, for this uh, supranational uh, judicial approach. But if we had full single market access, we'd have to sign up to the regulations, wouldn't we? No. No, the whole point is that 95% uh, of UK businesses do not do trade with Europe. Uh, but they have to conform with 100% of the regulations. Those businesses that want to export to the EU, and we want to encourage that, we do a free trade deal, uh, would of course, like the Americans or the Canadians or, or the Chinese or anybody else, exporting to the EU would have to make sure that their vehicles or whatever it happened to be conform to EU standards if they wanted to have access to that market. But there's no reason why we in this country should be subject anymore mm -hmm. to the single judicial system mm -hmm. of the single market. That is what I'm saying. And just to play devil, my final question, Chairman, just to play devil's advocate on that point, um, if it were possible to do the deal you're describing, um, why hasn't Norway done it? Because they are subject to budgetary contributions, they are subject to free movement as a quid pro quo for the kind of access you're describing. This is the fifth biggest economy in the world and it's been in the EU for 44 years. We, they have with us a net balance of trade of, in their favour, about £80 billion, pounds, I think. Uh, they have had all sorts of economic shocks, which you discussed extensively this morning. Uh, they're going to want to rapidly to move over Brexit as fast as possible, do a brilliant free trade deal, get on with it, uh, allow their businesses to trade freely uh, with a huge market to profit from engagement with us. That's the future for them as well as for us. Thank you very much, you. Boris. I'd just like to end with one point and give you an opportunity for a last word. First of all, I'm very grateful that um, uh, you've been able to give evidence now for nearly three hours, and normally we take a break after two uh, if we have an extended session, as we do occasionally with the perfect. governor of the bank. I just want to come back to a point, that, and it relates to almost everything you've been asked, <coughs> I was trying to get at at the start which is whether you accept that some of the claims you've been making, even in recent weeks in some cases in speeches, can easily mislead people. And wouldn't it be better to qualify these remarks uh, much more carefully? And I'll just take you through a few of them. Just now you said that uh, immigration has a huge downward impact on wages. As far as I'm aware, that's an extremely controversial issue and that evidence on it is... Uh, very difficult to pin down, certainly in agriculture. Well, just hang on, hang on a moment. I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you a chance to reply to all the points. I'm going to make. You've said that 
and by all means scribble down the headings. You, you, you said that there uh, would not be uh, any economic shock, even in the short term, of Brexit. Even though your own economic advisor, and I'm quoting only recently, said leaving the EU would be an economic shock. Most, if not all, economic shocks depress economic activity. Um, you said that in a speech very recently in Dartford, that uh, 400 pounds would be added to the was being added to the cost of food of every household. But anybody listening to that might think, oh, well, if I leave the EU, then I might pick up 400 pounds of benefit. But as you yourself, once you were cross-examined on it, thoroughly acknowledged, that's not the case. That but there would be a saving. You, you come back you in a moment. Okay, go on. You Nip make clear away. that that figure would be lower. You said uh, about half an hour ago in, in cross-examination with John Mann, I think it was with John Mann, that you made no comment on the directive that led to this dispute or this extraordinary exchange on tea bags. But actually, when you look at the speech you made, you described the directive as ludicrous, quite the opposite of uh, the Sorry, impression that you gave in response to that question. And you said, I mean, we can carry on with well, so many on. of these, uh, you said that between half and two-thirds of everything that goes through Parliament is being produced by Brussels. But actually, uh, the facts are that the, uh, the best sources suggest between 15 and 59 percent is either uh, produced or at least influenced, is the word used, influenced by the, by the EU. In other words, this is not produced by Brussels between half and two-thirds. It's between 15 and 59 percent. And uh, it's influenced in some way. And that this includes uh, the decisions, which relate often to individual firms, which constitutes about a third of the total number in itself. So I come back to my original question, by all means qualify further the answers you've given on each of those points, or all if you feel necessary. Yeah, I will. Uh, uh, I just want you to ask you whether you'd be prepared to consider, given that we need to have a sensible debate about this subject, there are some very foolish claims, as you've already seen, which many in this committee think are being made by the Remain uh, camp, but it seems that you are now um, fueling no, uh, I'm the grateful. fire I'm with grateful. some of your own. Right, I'm grateful. Look, look, let's go through. Look, if I may, uh, Mr. Tyre, I'll go through. I'll go through your 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 points one by. And you may have the last one. One, 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 one by one. Um, I think that on perhaps a huge downward pressure on on wages. Yes, it's a matter of great uh, of great economic <coughs> control. I think in some places, some sectors of uh, of industry. Uh, business, there has been a considerable downward pressure as a result of uh, uh, the flow of the uncontrolled flow of, of unskilled labour. Uh, whether it's always huge or not, you know, people will uh, dispute. But I don't think many economists would debate, would, would really contest that there has been downward pressure on on so wages. Just now, to you clarify, could, you are withdrawing <coughs> the word huge. No, I'm saying it might not always be huge, but in, it is in some cases. I'm sure it has been. Uh, secondly, on your on your point about. And there's been a, in this city alone, I think in uh, real incomes have, have still, uh, best of my memory, are still not back up to the levels of, for the bottom two deciles, still not back up to the levels that they were in 2008. There has been a substantial downward pressure on wages, and there are many, that is, there are many factors for that, but immigration is, is, certainly, is certainly one of them. On, on the, 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 the vexed issue of what would happen uh, if we uh, left and the, and the shock that people uh, describe. I do think, and I'm grateful for what you've said about uh, the, some of the alarmism of the, uh, of the Remain campaign, I do think it is wildly overdone. The point I'm trying to make is I think that uh, by the time it were to happen, uh, it would be very much uh, priced in. People would understand the consequences. I think that if you look at the reason I, I make the analogy of the Y2K bug is because you know, by the time that happened, everybody had freaked out so much and that it passed without a, a batting of an eyelid. I think that the same thing would happen uh, with, with Brexit. We would simply get on with it, and business would get on with it. 
uh, and uh, it, the deals I've described would be uh, readily done on the back of what is already a huge free trade area. Uh, on, the, on the point about the cost of, of food, yes, there is a cost, an extra cost of food as a result of agricultural subsidy. What I tried to say in my long exchange with uh, Mr. Caravan is that uh, we are big net contributors to the EU agriculture budget as well as to the overall budget. Approximately 8.5 billion, maybe as much as 10 billion <coughs> pounds goes from us to the EU, never to be seen again. And it's a long time since the, uh, the Court of Orders has spent a long time not uh, signing off the accounts of the EU. That even today, they continually point out that a large percentage of, uh, or uh, sorry, not a significant percentage of uh, the budget is, is misspent or, or can't be properly accounted for. I think 5% is a lot of money. If you think the EU budget's about over so 2007 to 2013, it's about 868 billion euros. You know, 4% of that, 5% of that, you're talking about serious sums of money uh, just going missing. Uh, it is not good use of taxpayers' money, uh, and it needs to come back to this country. And there would be savings on the agricultural budget if we did. On the point about the animal hygiene byproducts uh, legislation, uh, regulation, my point there was very simple. I made it repeatedly both to you and to John Mann. Uh, I do think that the real issue there is about gold plating. It's about how officials in our country take EU legislation. I'm, just, and, I'm sorry to interrupt, and, Boris. It, I only want just to read you what you actually said only very recently. Just sometimes these EU rules sound simply ludicrous, like the rule that you can't recycle a tea bag. I think most now, people that, would say that that does sound There doesn't seem to be much of a reference there to gold plating, a criticism of domestic I think, legislation. I think you will find that uh, either there or certainly frequently I've made the point about domestic uh, gold plating, and it does sound ludicrous. It is a result of the hideous confluence of EU uh, regulation and overzealous uh, implementation by uh, of, by officials in this in this country. As for the percentage of EU uh, regulation or legislation coming through this place, I think uh, after lengthy mastication, uh, we basically agreed here that uh, it is the, the the you get to the figure. If you look just look at the primary instruments and the di and the directives, you get you're, you're down at about 13 percent. But when you get up to if you include the statutory instruments and we had a, a long discussion about this, as you include the statutory instruments, uh, you're up almost at uh, two-thirds, 59% uh, of uh, law going through uh, this place. That is a huge amount. And the, being the important point, the important Brussels, point, the important being produced? Emanating from Brussels in, in, in such a way, this is the crucial thing, as to fall within EU competence. And once it's within EU competence, it is justiciable by the European Court. That is the, that is the crucial thing. And I, I'm, I'm grateful... I'm, I'm grateful. It's very helpful to have that clarification. Thank you. I'm grateful for um, this opportunity to make these points because I feel that uh, far from my having to uh, clear up some of the things I've said, it is up to the Remain campaign and their running dogs in Infacts and others... Uh, to explain why they, to explain why they have got You're it in so, danger of so getting stu back to, so stunningly to wrong delivering on, us grains of truth with mountains so, of nonsense so again. I'm no, afraid. I'm sorry. I'm, 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 uh, sorry. I'm, I'm telling you the truth. You, uh, you were dangerously close to making some very considered <coughs> points a moment ago. Anyway, I'm let, very let me give you. I'll give you. I'll, I'll just consider. By all means, do have the last three, point. Th three, three points. The, the, the reasons for uh, for wanting Brexit. Uh, it, the fundamentally uh, three. One. It's too expensive, the EU, as it currently stands. We need our money back. Eight and a half, ten billion net is, is an awful lot, particularly when a lot of it is, is wasted. Second, it's about control. It's about power. It's about democracy. It's about this place. It is really being undermined. It is absurd that we can't control our borders. The volume of legislation is now absurd. The third reason is the fundamental dishonesty of continuing to pretend that we are part of a free trading arrangement when it is a political project and we should level with the British public about what is really going on. That's extremely helpful clarification uh, of your justification for your decision. And I'm very grateful to you for having stayed for three hours, which is, as I say, an hour longer than we it's normally have sessions hours. without yeah. an interval. You've provided some extremely interesting, varied and um, 